Number 10, Hathor. The goddess Hathor was originally created by her dad, Ra, as a destroyer of men. She was supposed to punish all those who were disobedient to him. But then Ra was like, meh. I don't really like that idea. He just kind of changed his mind and decided to make her the exact opposite. Instead, the goddess of love. But she kind of loved killing men and like even he couldn't stop her. So one night he gave her what was supposed to be a mug of ale, but actually made it like a special kind of blood. And she got so drunk off of it that she got too tired out to kill anymore and therefore became the goddess of love. <laughs> Drunk in love, am I right? Her cult was centered in Dendera, where she was also seen as the goddess of fertility and childbirth. When the Greeks occupied Egypt, they compared her with the goddess Aphrodite. But unlike the voluptuous woman Aphrodite was depicted as, Hathor came in three forms, and I bet you can't guess which. She was depicted as either a woman with a cow's ears, wearing the headdress of a cow, or just a cow. Moo. <laughs> Number nine, the beginning of the world. I yeah, what a what an inventive way to imagine the beginning of things. I mean, the Big Bang is still pretty crazy too. But hey, here we go. Freaking love how much magic is in these stories. Like I'm in because that's all there was at the beginning of the universe, according to the ancient Egyptians. Just swirling darkness, chaos, and magic. Heka, the god of magic, was the only thing that existed, waiting for the opportune moment to begin. Then a hill showed up called Ben Ben, and out of which the god Atum erupted from. He was lonely, so he mated with his own shadow to give birth to two children, Shu and Tefnut. Shu gave life, Tefnut gave order. They left their their father to build the world, but they were gone so long he took out his eye and sent it to search for them. In the meantime, he just kind of sat there contemplating eternity all alone. It was really sad. This guy sounds like Zeus mixed with Eeyore. Anyways, his kids came back and he was so happy he wept tears of joy and out of which were born men and women. They also brought his eye back, so that was nice. Number eight, light as a feather. So unlike a lot of religions we've heard of, there wasn't really a concept of hell in Egyptian mythology. It was either you were worthy of heading into the afterlife or you weren't. Mat was the goddess of harmony and supported the belief that if harmony was disrupted, it must be restored. Every ancient Egyptian myth in some form follows this format. But the most important role she played was in the afterlife. When the soul left the body, it would appear in the hall of truth in order to stand judgment before Osiris. The heart would be weighed on a golden scale against Mat white feather. If the heart was heavier, it would be devoured by a monster and the soul would disappear. If it was lighter, then you could go live in eternal bliss. So instead of several layers of burning torment, souls in Egypt instead faced eternal darkness and unconsciousness. The idea of non-existence was more terrifying than being cut up by demons. Huh. Number seven, Osiris and Isis. Okay, so we aren't strangers to deities being a fan of incest. It was kind of like how they multiplied and ancient Greeks were okay with it kind of, but they kind of weren't. Anyways, the Egyptian gods were no exception. Isis and Osiris were two of the four children of the goddess of Nut. Isis and Osiris were married and actually, really in love. They, they, they dug each other. When Osiris rose to the throne as the eldest sibling, his brother Set was, pretty jealous. So he took the life of his own brother, cut him into little pieces and scattered them all over Egypt. He really wanted to make sure the guy was dead. But then Isis wasn't someone you wanted to mess with. She had great magical powers capable of restoring life. She collected all of the pieces of her brother slash husband and breathed life back into him. Osiris returned to life and they made all the love and then soon conceived a child named Horus. However, Osiris couldn't return to the land of the living, so he had to stay and rule over the underworld. So his son Horus was left to get revenge and we'll get to that later. Number six, Anubis. Now I think in West Western films that depict ancient Egypt, like The Mummy Returns, the god Anubis is often associated with the underworld. You know, that creepy half man, half jackal creature who appears to walk out of your nightmares? He's so creepy. Well, he did used to run the underworld until Osiris took over, but he was actually the god of mummification and the afterlife. So not wrong, but not the whole story. Anubis was the son of Nephthys and Set. Well. Kind of. Nephthys actually never conceived the child with Set. She kind of had a, she kind of had the hots for Osiris. So she disguised herself as Isis and made love to him that way. And then Anubis came to life. That may have been one of the reasons Seth attacked Osiris in the first place as his suspicions rose. But it was actually Anubis who helped Isis piece together Osiris, creating the first mummy. Fun fact, 
During the Greek rule of Egypt, Anubis and Hermes were seen kind of as the same, the people who ferried the dead to the underworld. Oh, sorry, and a point. Anubis was actually the one who weighed people's hearts, so he used the feather. The thing, you know what to do. He was responsible for doing that. Number five, fake beards. I can't grow a beard, so maybe I'll just start rocking the, the fake one, you know, like Hatshepsut. Long before Cleopatra, Hatshepsut was the first woman to obtain power as a pharaoh. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. There were just a few that were women in total, but during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male. The pharaoh, fake beard, the massive muscles, historians believe that this was all done as an act of politics. After her passing, come 1458 BC, her stepson took the throne, Thutmose III, and he destroyed everything in her name and image. Well, mostly everything. Now we have this bearded pharaoh that we're pretty sure we figured out. Number four, acne. Ancient Egyptians came up with uh, an interesting method on getting rid of those pimples, that's for sure. Remind you, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing, so... Again, creative. Physicians back then discussed pimples as these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin from four to five years. And by squeezing these spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were called maggots back then. Imagine your partner, hey, can you get this pimple on my back? Yeah, I think I got some maggots in there. I don't know. I'd be sick. See ya, now we're single. They would refer to severe cases of acne as maggots that lie in a bed of roses. Hey, if a physician ever told me I had maggots that lie in a bed of roses on my persons, I would faint. That's the scariest news. I've ever heard in my life. That's some bad news, man. Dermatological disorders were thought to be human skin taking on the properties of animals. Yeah. Oh, you have acne? Hmm. Are you sure you're not turning into a bird? Maybe it's that. Come back next week. Ancient Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds, all to get rid of acne, hopefully. Sorry, maggots, not acne. Maggots. All to get rid of maggots. I'm gonna go throw up. Number three, prosthetics. The ancient Egyptians were a culture of firsts and some of their achievements we still have no idea how they were able to accomplish. Like the pyramids, I couldn't tell you, could you? Didn't think so, hit that thumbs up, we're both wrong, we're both learning. It's very likely that some of the first ever prosthetics were used in ancient Egypt. How fascinating, imagine being the first guy to make a toe, a fake toe. A female mummy who was discovered near Luxor had her death dated somewhere between 950 and 710 BCE. And she was also found with a prosthetic toe made from wood and leather on her persons. While this of course is a wonderful cosmetic replacement and it's no secret that the ancient Egyptians certainly valued aesthetics, it seems as though this prosthetic toe was completely functional and was actually used to help this woman walk. The toe, after it was discovered, had significant signs of wear and tear, which then inspired experts to start a study, look a little further. And they did. So they took participants and tested their gait, both with and without the use of a replicated toe. And in ancient Egypt, the common footwear were sandals, and walking in them would have been uh, next to impossible without a big toe. So it's clear that this prosthetic was very helpful and important to those similar to this Luxor mummy. Not exactly a beauty practice, but I'm sure they also felt a little more confident with that toe. This is also too impressive to exclude. Beauty list. I'm like, yeah, toes are beautiful. Why not? Throw them on. Number two, henna. I got henna done a few years ago and I totally blanked. I forgot that it lasted longer than like two days. I was like, day four, I'm like, what's going on, man? Is this permanent? While on one hand, pun intended, it is beautiful, ancient Egyptians' use of henna went beyond style and beyond imaging oneself after the gods. See, henna also has cooling effects on the body and ancient Egypt was, uh, was quite hot. It was used by ancient Egyptians to color their hair and fingernails and shades of red and orange. Now this shade, this exact shade, also provided comfort on hot days. Come back with some henna. Kind of nice. It lasts longer than a few days though, just so you know, if you want to get henna. It's important to know. That guy did not tell me in Greece. No, he did not. And finally, number one, deodorant. When it comes to deodorant, today we listen to the Old Spice guy. He's always whistling about something new. But long before he was born, ancient Egyptians used ostrich eggs for deodorant. They made perfumes and oils, this is commonly known, but they were also the first to use any type of deodorant like underarm deodorant. It was so impressive. Ostrich eggs mixed with a little fat and tamarisk and tortoise shell and then nuts. Mix them all together and bam, there you go. You're ready for date night. Just apply all of that on your body. Another method was a little more yummy than ostrich eggs and nuts. See, Egyptians would also use porridge balls. How creative is that? Flavored porridge rolled up and safely tucked in in your underarm right there. Right there on your little smelly chicken wing. This morning I had some deodorant just crumble apart when I was applying it. You ever had that happen? Turns to feta cheese all of a sudden, mid-application. Now my bathroom sink looks like a Greek salad. It smells great, but not practical. Might have to go back to the porridge ball method. Who knows? Maybe I have one right now. Maybe that's why I haven't moved this arm the whole time. Who knows? Ancient curses, animal bones, and empty tombs. 
we have a rather dark one today, folks. Welcome back to Bumblebee. Here are top 10 hidden doors found in Egyptian tombs that should never be opened. Number 10, false doors. Okay, right off the bat, imagine searching for a lost Egyptian tomb, all right? Imagine you've spent years of your life dedicating to this research, and then you find a door. You find an entrance carved into the wall, and this is it. What lies beyond? It's time. You try and carefully open it with a team of archaeologists, but it won't budge because it's a fake door. It's a false door. Yeah, just a Looney Tunes door. Somebody juked you out 4,500 years ago. Gotcha. Their spirit's been waiting that long to be like, nice, idiot. All right, we can go. We're good. False doors in Egyptian tombs were quite common in ancient Egyptian times. But if we look elsewhere throughout history, we find false doors in ancient Rome, in both tombs and the interior of homes. So that ought to be confusing for any house guests back then. It's also important to note that Egyptian culture was influenced by Mesopotamian architecture. So we've had fake doors around for a while now. A lot of confusing people for thousands of years. Ancient Egyptians believed that these false doors were a connection to the dead, and that spirits were able to travel here and there throughout living and death. Most false doors can be found on the West Wall because Egyptians believed the West to be the land of the dead. Number nine, the tomb of Uzer. Back in March 2010, the Egyptian Supreme Council of Antiquities released this photo. This six foot tall slab of pink granite was carved over 3,500 years ago, and this door was found near Karnak Temple in Luxor, and originally it belonged to the chief minister of Queen Hatshepsut back in the 15th century. Now, Uzer was a high ranking official and held the position of vizier for 20 years at that time, so in turn, he got his own fancy tomb located on the west bank of the Nile. Remember, Egyptians associate the west with the land of the dead. That's gonna come in quite a few times in this video. The actual slab of granite, this door, was found far away from its home. It had been moved thousands of years later and ended up in an ancient Roman era building. Never thought I'd have to say this, but um, don't steal doors from the dead. Got it? Okay, let's move on. Number eight, Alexandria Black Tomb. What if we found a tomb and then just opened it, you know? What if we found a mysterious black granite tomb in Alexandria, say back in 2018? Do you think it would be wise to just open it because we're curious? Spoiler alert, we opened it and it was exactly what we thought it was going to be. When archeologists found this massive tomb untouched for over thousands of years, on one hand, yeah, that's a feat in itself, but us humans, we're curious creatures. We just gotta, just a little peek just to see who's in there. I mean, after all, it could be Alexander the Great, right? That's the whole point of all this. Egyptian news outlet El Watan reported that the tomb was lifted only a few centimeters before every official involved at that construction site just fled the scene. They straight up just ran away. It smelled that bad. Mustafa Waziri, Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities, this guy put his entire head in the tomb just to show us that it's safe. That's great. I mean, you could use your hand, maybe even a foot, I guess, just a little foot dip, but straight to the head dipping? Come on, Mr. Waziri, be smart about this. Number seven, Valley of the Kings. While March 2020 wasn't the best month of all time by any means, Egyptian officials did locate a secret vault hiding in the sands of the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. Just off the west bank of the Nile, the Valley of the Kings, as its name hints towards, is a pretty historical part of Egypt's past. Again, do we want to open this vault? Probably not, but did we? Yes. Bones and goo and history. What do you know? Surprise, surprise. Number six, 2020 tombs. Summer 2020, nice. While most of us was stuck inside watching Netflix, more than 100 sealed coffins were found. And yes, they were occupied for the most part. Found, of course, in Saqqara, Egypt, Egyptian archeologists have never been more excited. Maybe we'll find the body of Cleopatra. Wouldn't that just be dandy? The fact that we found over 100 of these still in great shape is mind blowing. Grave robbers have been around since ancient Egyptian days, and for all these to be untouched for this long is honestly unbelievable. These findings date back to 712 BC, which was a period where Egypt was controlled by foreign civilizations. That's what makes this so insane. Like Persians and Greeks, they were all around at this time. The idea that we're finding mummies is great and all, but again, do we need to open all of them up? Maybe there's treasure, maybe there's bodies. Either way, it's not yours. <laughs> Am I insane? Maybe I'm insane. Do we need to find Alexander the Great this badly that we're willing to disrespect this many souls in the process? Number five, the lost labyrinth. Archaeologists uncovered what's believed to be the remains of a long lost labyrinth below the sand of the Pyramid of Hawara, known as, quote, the labyrinth. Built by Amenhet III, it was the most visited sites of the ancient world. Greek Herodotus claimed to have counted 3,000 rooms in the pyramid's funeral complex during the 5th century BC. According to them, the underground temple consists of over 3,000 rooms filled with remarkable hieroglyphics and paintings. Close, too, located less than 100 kilometers from Cairo. In 2008, with the aid of ground penetrating technology, a Belgian Egyptian expedition was able to confirm the presence of an enormous underground temple. With 
with no visible remains, the story was thought to be a legend passed down until Egyptologists uncovered its foundations in the 1800s. The results of this expedition indicate the presence of grid-like structures deep beneath the sand. Please tell me there's no minotaur just running around down there. Okay. Number four, the mystery queen. Archaeologists have unearthed a tomb of a previously unknown queen believed to have been the wife of Pharaoh Neferefra, who ruled 4,500 years ago. The tomb was discovered in Abu Sur, an old kingdom necropolis southwest of Cairo, where there are several pyramids dedicated to the pharaohs of the fifth dynasty. The name of his wife had not been known until recently. She was Kenta Kaz, renowned as the mother of two Egyptian pharaohs. Kenta Kaz I is a mysterious woman who ruled in the fourth dynasty dynasty and has archaeologists puzzled at her burial complex in Giza. Though rough evidence for ancient Egyptian queens, the remains of this female leader were undisturbed for two millennia within the necropolis until its excavation in the late 1930s. Hieroglyphic inscriptions concerning her title had been discovered and subsequently became open for interpretation. Her title was initially regarded to be, quote, King of Upper and Lower Egypt and, quote, Mother of King of Upper and Lower Egypt. So who was this mysterious, powerful figure in ancient Egypt? Who was she? Number three. The Dendera Lights. All these tombs and underground chambers, how the hell did they see anything under there? Well, we really don't know, but we have some sort of direction. These ancient battery looking light bulbish things could have maybe been the power source. Ancient Egypt seems to be full of keyholes, drill holes, and shafts that are literally impossible without high powered tools. Most people say aliens, me included, but I also say the Dendera light bulbs. They've been theorized as being some sort of battery. The Hothor temple at Dendera contains several relief depictions, Harsimtus in the form of a snake, emerging from a lotus flower. The Dendera light is a variation of this mode of showing Harsimtus in an oval container, a snake inside taking a number of humans to lift, and it holds apparent meanings of the start of creation. Look, I don't care what you say, this thing is a light bulb. It's got a filament and coils. Come on, drill holes? They couldn't have just lit fires underground, the smoke, the heat, I don't think so. Now a couple of DeWalts, just sanding up the pyramids real nice, you know? Who knows? Who knows? Number two, the city of Punt. The land of Punt or the ancient city of Punt was an ancient kingdom sometime back then. A trading partner of ancient Egypt, it was known for producing and exporting gold, aromatic resins, precious stones, black wood, ivory, you name it. The region is known from ancient Egyptian records of trade expeditions. At time, Punt is referred to as the land of God. No pressure, archeologists. The exact location of Punt is debated and unknown by historians. Cue Indiana Jones movie. Various locations have been offered southeast of Egypt, a Red Sea coastal region, Somalia, Ethiopia, Sudan, no one really knows. First deciphered in Egyptian hieroglyphics in 1822, scholars began reading Egyptian texts and the mystery got mystery -er. That's not a word. More questions arose as to where Punt was located and what happened to it. The land of Punt is written by voyagers as being praised for its lavish riches and goodness of land. Okay, so it exists somewhere. This is awesome, isn't it? Wouldn't it suck if we already found everything? We're going on an expedition, boy. Grab your thing, let's go. And coming into the number one spot, the Sphinx. Where do I even start? Known as the oldest carved rock like ever, its age is debated literally every day due to the questions it asks scholars. Was it wind erosion, water? erosion? How many times was this thing broken and rebuilt? The Great Sphinx of Giza, the limestone statue of a reclining sphinx, a mythical creature with a head of a human and a body of a lion. Facing directly west to east, it stands on the Giza Plateau on the west bank of the Nile. The face of the sphinx appears to represent the pharaoh Khafre, although this is heavily debated as wrong gears and looking nothing like him. It's since been restored with tons of layers of limestone blocks, although still unfixed. Its nose was broken off for unknown reasons between the 3rd and 10th century. Maybe some artillery fire over the years? Who knows? The Sphinx is the oldest known sculpture in Egypt, and archaeologists suggest that it was created in the Old Kingdom using unknown construction methods. Yeah, definitely that battery thing. From 1817 to 1930, this thing was buried up to its neck and written and drawn about for centuries. I wonder what other secrets lay under her right now. I guess we'll eventually find out someday. I wonder what else is just waiting to be dug up, you know? Imagine they find a cell phone. At number 10, Treaties of the Vessels. I think that most of us love the idea of uncovering some kind of lost treasure. I, for one, would love to pull an Indiana Jones and uncover artifacts lost to the sands of time, but realistically, you need a lot of clues in order to find these things. They could be anywhere. The world is quite a large place, you know. That's why ancient texts and documents are so important to researchers, because sometimes they can give clues as to where some treasures might be. This is sort of the case with the Treaties of the Vessels. 
Scrolls. This ancient Hebrew text claims to reveal the location of where the treasures of King Solomon's temple are hidden. Well, sort of. The text discusses the location of the treasures as well as the fate of the Ark of the Covenant, which is a chest that is said to hold tablets engraved with the Ten Commandments. And as you would imagine, these are highly sought after, but no one knows where it is and the treaties of the vessels isn't really much help to researchers. The text says that the location of these things will quote, not be revealed until the day of the coming of the Messiah, son of David. So it just teases us with this mystery. We still have to wait to find these treasures. At number 9. Gospel of the Lots of Mary Have you ever wished that you could know the future? Maybe you want to know how a relationship would play out, or if you should do something about your career, but you just need that little confirmation of future events to help you along. Well, if you lived in ancient times, then you might have sought out the Gospel of the Lots of Mary to help you with your needs. This ancient text is quite the gospel and dates back to around 1500 years. The Gospel of the Lots of Mary doesn't discuss the life of Jesus Christ, but instead contains contains 37 oracles that were written pretty vaguely. The original text was written in Coptic, an Egyptian language, and has been translated in modern times. The book opens with the words, quote, The Gospel of the Lot of Mary, the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, she to whom Gabriel the archangel brought the good news, he who will go forward with his whole heart will obtain what he seeks, only do not be of two minds. End quote. Researchers believe that this book would have been used for divination in an attempt to seek knowledge of the future. Someone in need of answers would seek out this book, ask a question, and then would have gone through a process that would randomly select one of the 37 oracles to give answers to said person's problem. Almost like how we read horoscopes, but much more mysterious. Before we carry on talking about these strange and mysterious texts, why not leave a big ol' thumbs up on this video if you are thoroughly entertained so far? And while you're at it, why not subscribe to the channel to see more videos like this one and join the hive. At right, number 8, Liber Lintius. This next ancient text almost counts as a hidden message because of where this text was found by researchers. The Liber Lintius is an ancient text written in Estrusian, a language that was used in Italy in ancient times. What makes this text so mysterious is the fact that it was found preserved in the wrappings of an Egyptian mummy that dates back around 2200 years. This ancient text meaning isn't exactly clear, partially because the Etrusian language isn't fully understood, but researchers believe that the written text on the mummy's wrappings are of a ritual calendar. More research is needed to fully decipher this mysterious text, but it's a really cool find nonetheless. At number 7, Gospel of Judas. Guys, we might have quite the plot twist on our hands, and it's all thanks to this mysterious ancient text. Researchers found a 3rd century text that they called the Gospel of Judas, and after being translated, might have revealed an alternate version of an event from the Bible. Originally written in Coptic, the Gospel of Judas seems to be a depiction of Judas Iscariot the man who betrayed Jesus in the New Testament in a positive light. In the New Testament, Judas was said to have betrayed Jesus by revealing his identity to those who had come to arrest him in exchange for 30 pieces of silver, but in the Gospel of Judas, it describes Jesus as asking Judas to betray him in order for him to be crucified so that he could ascend to heaven. This plot twist is debated among some people though, as other researchers have said that the text actually declares Judas as a demon. Either way, it's a new spin on the story that that we didn't have before, and I'd say that's pretty darn mysterious. At number 6, Grolier Codex. Imagine owning something that you believe was just a piece of art, turned out to actually be an ancient artifact. This kind of thing is actually a lot more common than you'd think, since over the years, pillaging and looting of ancient sites have led to many artifacts being misplaced and sold around the world. This is the case with the Grolier Codex. The Grolier Codex is an ancient Mayan codex that contains Maya hieroglyphs, illustrations of gods, and a calendar that tracks the movement of Venus. Want to know where they found it? In a club in New York. The person who acquired the codex, a Mexican collector named Jose Sanez, said that he got it from a group of looters in the 1960s, and after a lot of debate, it was found that the codex that he had was in fact authentic. Researchers found that this ancient text was written on paper that dates back about 800 years and was written using paint known as Maya Blue, which actually wasn't synthesized in a lab until pretty recently. I think it's pretty crazy that this ancient text from the Maya civilization somehow ended up in New York and no one really noticed. Number five. Five, fake beard. I need one of these because, uh, yeah, I tried recently and it disappeared off the channel. I was too, I was too ashamed to come back. Long before Cleopatra, Hatshepsut was the first woman to obtain power as a 
pharaoh. This is pretty impressive. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. There were just a few that were women in total, but during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male, as a male pharaoh. So the pharaoh fake beard, the massive muscles, historians believe that this was done as an act of politics. Now after her passing come 1458 BC, her stepson took the throne, Thutmose III, and he destroyed everything in her name. He, yeah, just scripted, back then it wasn't, you know, hard to just, you break one thing and then everything's gone. Well, mostly everything. Now we have this idiot being like, hey, fake beards, look at that, you missed one. Number four, game night. I love board games, even Monopoly, believe it or not. I have the patience for it every now and then. But ancient Egyptians, they also fancied a board game, turns out, who knew? Dogs and Jackals, Mahen, Senate, and 20 Squares. These were all popular go-to games for their ancient Egyptian cottage weekends. Mahen was played around 2500 BC, and the goal was to reach the center of the spiral first. The board was a coiled snake almost. It was quite beautiful. Senate was the most popular game. Queens and kings alike would play this one. Senate had a long board with 30 squares painted on it. Now, of course, the rules are still unknown and heavily debated, just like Monopoly. But you had three rows of 10 squares. The last five squares are decorated, so it's assumed that this game was themed on the afterlife. Plus, King Tut was buried with one of these game boards. There's something very Jumanji about this that I want to know more of, but I also don't want to know more of. Why was he buried with a board game? That's kind of terrifying. There's also some paintings of Queen Nefertiti playing a board game of sorts. Yeah, it kind of looks a lot like chess. Imagine playing a pharaoh in chess. My palms would be so sweaty. I'd be like, checkmate, please don't exile me. Thanks so much. Let's play again sometime. Peace. Number three, the first peace treaty. Bizarre at the time? Absolutely. Definitely. This is a first. The first peace treaty in history was back in 1271 BC. Now at this point in time, Egyptians and the Hittite Empire, they were fighting over modern day Syria. Now this conflict had been lasting centuries and come 1274 BC, the Battle of Kadesh was now underway. At this point, there's tons of bloodshed, no clear victor in sight. So what's left to do at this point? A peace treaty, right? Hopefully, ideally, Ramses II and King Hattusili the Third, both negotiated a peace treaty where both sides would aid each other if a third party decided to now get involved. A copy of the treaty can be found in New York right above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council chamber. Pretty impressive. I have a license plate above my room, so that's almost as cool, I guess. It's also in the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest peace treaty, so that's how you know it's official. Guinness confirms it. Moving on. Number two, renewed passport. Now I'm thinking about where my passport is and I'm immediately panicking. I'm like, oh, which shelf? Ooh. Before a big bad haunting number one, we'll do a fun one with some recent history. This is cheeky. Passports are important and they're a pain to replace. But did you know that you can still get one even if you've been dead for thousands of years? Well, now you do. You just have to be a pharaoh though. That's the only rule. You have to be a pharaoh or some sort of king. Pharaoh Ramses II, we just talked about him, one of ancient Egypt's greatest rulers. He got a passport back in 1974. Insane, the same time my grandma did probably. After being exhumed and put on display for so long, it was decided that it's now time to send this lost king off to Paris to get touched up. Now, obviously, you're not going to list this pharaoh king as luggage. That would be super disrespectful. So the Egyptian government gave Ramses II his own official Egyptian passport for his commute with a photo. Just in case you didn't know. On the passport, he had his info. It's all great. He has age, very old, occupation, a king. And in case it wasn't obvious, it was stated that the king was deceased. Looking at him, you're like, oh, yeah, certainly. Yeah, go on in. Definitely dead. For sure dead. Don't even have to look twice. We're good. And finally, number one, trusty servant. In ancient Egypt, it was common for servants to accompany their masters into the afterlife. Whenever they go, now you have to go. Horrible, right? This practice reflected the belief that individuals needed assistance and companionship even in the realm of the dead. Hashtag needy. Servants were considered essential for ensuring the comfort and well-being of the deceased here and again in the afterlife, which doesn't make a lot of sense, but again, long time ago, different beliefs. They would be depicted in tomb paintings and inscriptions, and their statues or figurines would be placed in these tombs to then serve the deceased. These servants were believed to continue their duties in the afterlife, providing sustenance, performing daily tasks, and maintaining the deceased social status. Like, when does it end, guy? Like, fuck. Come on. The inclusion of servants and burial rituals exemplifies the importance of social hierarchy and the idea of continuity in ancient Egyptian culture. So while it's crazy to us, it's, well, it's very important then. 
Kicking off our list at number 10, Ancient Egyptian Eyeliner. Whenever you see hieroglyphics or any art depicting the great pharaohs, they're usually rocking some impressive eyeliner. They look great, right? Like a 90s pop star, they look awesome. Ancient Egyptians were the OG eyeliner users. They made their own eyeliner from lead salts. And no, before you think about getting creative, do not try this at home. This wasn't an ideal process. See, for starters, these salts were quite high in lead concentration. So in order to avoid that mess, ancient Egyptians first had to process and then filter that lead salt for up to 30 days in order to get the lead levels low enough to even be applied. So you had to plan accordingly. They're like, oh, I have a pharaoh date in 30 days. Perfect. We'll start now. It was a hazard if done incorrectly. Not only was this ancient beauty practice, well, beautiful to look at, but Egyptians also needed eyeliner to protect against sun damage as well as fight off any infections. Yeah, we don't encourage rubbing lead on your eyes today. We have a few different methods on, you know, how to look good. I think. None of them include lead, hopefully, ideally. Number nine, hair gel. Back in my day in high school, I had to use Dippity Doo Extra Hold Hair Gel. Yeah, I showed a scale on the side. I always got the five out of six hold. That was good. Six was too much. Nobody ever did the full six. That's crazy talk. But in ancient Egypt, we didn't have styling spiking glue and blasting free spray by DJ Polly D. No, we have that today, unfortunately, but back then, a little different. Back then, ancient Egyptians loved styling their hair, but again, before DJ Polly D was born, what is a pharaoh to do? If the Great Pyramids are any indication, they knew something that we didn't. Ancient Egyptians knew how to keep their hair in one place all day long. And that heat too, how do you do it? My curls, I'm jealous. Their hair styling gel was made with shea butter and coconut oil. But more often than not, they would replace coconut oil with almond oil. So this was a completely natural and strengthening styling gel. Cut to today, we have whatever that is. Psst, ice spray, that's awesome. DJ Polly. psst. No. Number eight, coffee scrub. I love coffee. I don't think I love coffee enough to do a coffee face scrub, but hey, never say never. I'll try anything once. Ancient Egyptians would use coffee scrub to reduce inflammation, improve blood circulation, and since it's a ground up material, it's gonna remove those dead skin cells at the same time. Next holiday season, grab your aunt some coffee scrub. Just tell her how it reduces puffiness, improves the skin's texture, all that good stuff. It'll give you that youthful feral look that you've been going for, you know what I mean? Merry Christmas, here you go, coffee on your face. Using grounded coffee powder to exfoliate your skin sounds like a new idea. It's certainly a hot trend today. But before TikTok, ancient Egyptians already knew these benefits. Damn, I'm gonna get a coffee scrub. Maybe I'll do it, I don't know. After I'm done this cup, I'll just rub it on my face, on my desk, and see what uh, everyone says. Number seven, dead sea salt. You'll never feel more alive than when you use dead sea salt. Here we go. Ancient Egyptians were ahead of the exfoliation game. Dare I say, they invented it. Not only were coffee scrubs a necessity, but salt from the dead sea was one of the most popular ancient Egyptian skincare products ever. We traveled far and wide for this one. Salt collected from the Dead Sea was used to exfoliate dead skin cells, and it was so well known at this point that rumor has it, Cleopatra herself would travel all the way to the Dead Sea from Egypt just to take a bath. Yeah, let's be honest, after this point, we'd all love a rejuvenating Dead Sea float. That sounds way better than what I've got at home. Well, bath I can't even fit in this thing. Dead Sea sounds way better. I once left a house party early to go have a bath. Swear to God, York University. Dipped at like 10 o'clock. I was like, I'm cold, I'm not doing this. 40 minute walk, worth it. Leave your friends for a bath, do it. Number six, wax cones. Head cones, also known as perfume cones, were used in ancient Egypt. You've probably seen them in a thumbnail here at some point. The art depicting head cones is quite unique looking. It's like a pharaoh with a triangle on their head. You're like, what's happening there? What is this? Was like Illuminati? What is this? Long before Pantene Pro-V, when it came to head cleanliness, these triangular wax cones were here to save the day. And they looked pretty fun to use. I don't know. They would just sit on top of your head. You didn't need to mix anything with lead for 30 days or brain or anything like that. You don't need to put any organs in jars, just a wax cone on top of your head. Easy. Back in 2019, experts found archeological evidence that they were in fact used. So yeah, not just a glyph real life history. So I have to bring this up. Men and women alike would wear this cone and your body heat would slowly melt the wax cone down and through your hair. The cone itself was made of oils, fat, resin. It would be placed on their wig or directly onto your head and it would keep melting and refreshing all day long. It's like a little candle almost. A nice little human candle. Nice little Egyptian man candle. As fascinating as ancient Egyptian culture is, I don't think anybody misses wax cones. It's a little easier nowadays. I'm too tall too. I can't have a wax cone. Are you kidding me? It would hit this mic. No way. At number five, marooning. Let's talk about the brutal yet mysterious practice of marooning, and no, we're not talking about Maroon 5. Marooning was a pirate punishment, probably the most dreaded punishment of them all, where someone who committed a serious offense would be taken to a deserted island and then left there. 
No food, no water, just you and the island. For many, this was a slow and painful death. Being left on an island in the hot sun meant you got badly sunburnt, you had no food unless you could find something in the area, and chances were that there was no fresh water on that island, so you would become dehydrated quite quickly. At high tide, the water could flood the island, or you would be left standing in water up to your neck, and any predators in the area would have seen you as a little snack. This sounds like a terrible way to go. I could not imagine the physical and psychological torment that would come with such a fate. Man, I'm glad I'm not a pirate. Number four, pirate curfew. This next one made me laugh out loud while I was reading up on it. It doesn't matter how badass or cool you think you are, even if you're a literal pirate, you still have a bedtime. These guys would straight up abandon their mateys, they would leave them on an island to die, and then sword fight over treasure. But come 8 o'clock, it's time to shut her down. Because it's pirate code, you can't break the code. Captain Black Bart Bartholomew Roberts, he insisted back in 1722 that lights and candles were out at 8 o'clock sharp. If anybody wanted to stay up later than 8, they can go and hang out on the deck. Honestly, I love this rule. I'm here for this. Imagine roommates being on board for this as well. Nowadays, you get the best sleep of your life. Thing is, these guys needed all the time they could get because they had to sleep in hammocks. Not the most comfortable or relaxing environment. A hammock nap, sure, but a hammock sleep every night? No wonder pirates were so angry. It's starting to make sense. At number three, cryptic treasure. There once lived a pirate named Olivier Levasseur, and he was considered one of the last great pirates. Over the years, it was said that Levasseur had stolen many treasures of great value and had a large haul of precious finds. Once people finally caught up to him, he was captured and sentenced to death by hanging, but before he died, his final words were, quote, find my treasure, the one who may understand it, end quote. And then he threw a cryptogram into the crowd, and that was the last of them. To this day, no one has been able to decipher the code. Some believe that perhaps this cryptic message was simply designed to lead people on a wild goose chase as a final joke. However, in the 20th century, a man named Reginald Herbert Cruz Wilkins, say that five times fast, made a breakthrough. He had been searching for the treasure for years and finally found the cave that he believed the treasure was located. Unfortunately, the cave's conditions made it impossible to get through, so the treasure remains a mystery to this day. Can you believe this all started because a pirate wanted to pull a Da Vinci code on us? Unbelievable. Number two, Julius Caesar. Pirates would often take people and demand treasure. They would use hostage situations as a main ploy. In fact, at one point in history, pirates managed to scoop up Julius Caesar like the Julius Caesar. The Emperor of Rome went through his fair share of trials, and at just age 25, he was held captive for 38 days with pirates. That's a very long time to hear horrible sea chanties. When pirates demanded ransom for the release of the young man, they set his price for 20 talents, but according to historians, that price was deemed too low from Caesar himself. He actually laughed at it and reminded these pirates that they had no idea who it was they captured. He said to ask for 50 instead of 20. How insane is that? And finally, at number one, pirate tunnels. You know the secret tunnel from Avatar The Last Airbender? Well, this secret pirate tunnel is kind of similar. Below the city of Savannah, Georgia lies a series of underground tunnels that are believed to have been used by pirates. The pirates would use these tunnel systems to smuggle goods in and out of the area, as well as to smuggle captured sailors. It is said that these tunnels would lead directly to the location where the ships would have been waiting in the harbor. Apparently, there is a tunnel that led from a building in town known as the Pirate's House all the way to the river where small rowing boats would have been waiting. It has also been theorized that the Sons of Liberty, a group of people who strongly opposed the British government, but also used these pirate tunnels to meet up and have a little shindig. There are so many mysteries that surround these pirate tunnels, and many of them remain unsolved. Number 10. Construction. We can't talk about ancient Egypt and the mysteries still unsolved there if we don't start on how the hell these things were built. And also, it's not just like three pyramids. There's 118 of these things. When did they have time to construct all of these? Ropes? Pulley systems? Yeah, I'm not convinced. Ramps? Ramps. Ramps would have been a mile long against the pyramid's height. That's like hundreds of years right there. You ever dug a hole in your backyard? Two feet. It's like six hours right there. And a sore back. Some have theorized a water hydraulic system was used to transport the carved rocks up slopes and tubes with tidal power. Okay, better, better. But like, how did they line up the rocks so perfectly 
and so square at the top. One inch off and every carpenter knows that's gonna shift everything. Also, the alignment to True North, the odd coincidences with the dimensions resembling the cosmos, they couldn't have known back then, you know? Buckle up, it's only gonna get weirder. Number nine, Chamber of Secrets. In 2017, scientists were able to peek inside the Great Pyramid finally using modern day physics. Particles, actually. What they found revealed numerous hidden secret chambers and rooms that were thought to never exist. The most bizarre discoveries was a massive unknown void nearly 100 feet long that lays just above the pyramid's grand gallery. Khufu, also known as the Great Pyramid, was received the most attention due to its size and age, but it wasn't the only chamber they found. No. Gold, mummies, manuscripts, ancient technology. What lies inside these voids? Also, how the hell did they floor and roof a room that's unaccessible? How do you build that inside such a small chamber already? Muon tomography uses cosmic rays of muons and generates a 3D image through nearly any material. This technology is groundbreaking. Literally. Uh, here we go. Yep, found it. There it is. Number eight, the Saqqara Temple. The Pyramid of Djoser, also known as the Steppe Pyramid, is an archeological site in the Saqqara Necropolis. The discovery of a 4,400 year old tomb now seen as UNESCO's World Heritage Site is the six tier four sided structure, which very well may be the earliest colossal stone structure in Egypt and possibly the world. Stone mounds were made in Europe for millennia, but it was the pyramid shape that started here. It was built 27th century BC during the third dynasty for the Pharaoh Djoser. The pyramid is the center of a huge complex and an enormous courtyard surrounded by ceremonial structures and decorations. Its architect was created from the Egyptian architect himself, Imhotep, the high priest of the god Ra. This guy was like the building manager, you know? The head architect. In fact, wasn't even found or really even studied till about the 1920s and was recently excavated in 2018. The pyramid went through several revisions over the years and in March 2020, the pyramid was officially reopened for visitors after a 14 year fix up. Check out Netflix, they do a great documentary on this. Number seven, Queen Nefertiti, the queen of the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt, the beloved royal wife of Pharaoh Akhenaten. Nefertiti and her husband were known for a religious revolution in which they worshipped solely the sun disk Aten as their one and only god. Oh! Blasphemy! She reigned during what was arguably the wealthiest and most lavish period of, of ancient Egypt. Here's the weird part. We don't know where she is. Usually kings and queens are buried in very spiritual, very high ranked places like the royal tomb. Easy to find. But nope, no one can find her. Or even know what happened to her. In 2015, archaeologists thought with high resolution scans, voids that are behind the walls of Tutankhamun's tomb proposed maybe that she was there. Nope, no Nefertiti. In 2003, archaeologists thought through the hair DNA, Nefertiti's mother may have been, quote, the younger lady. Nope, turns out it was just Tutankhamun's mom. So what exactly happened to this famously revered queen? Who knows? Aliens, dude. When in doubt, always aliens. You know what I mean? Number six, King Tut's death. When archeologists opened a sarcophagus in Egypt's Valley of the Kings for the first time in 1923, it was the discovery of a lifetime. The ancient Egyptian boy king, King Tutankhamun, the burial chamber of the 19 year old who ruled 3,300 years ago. But why did he die so young? DNA tests and CT scans show he suffered from malaria, a broken leg and congenital deformities associated with inbreeding, common amongst royalty. Ouch. Because of his tomb's extremely small size, historians think King Tut's death must have been unexpected and his burial rushed by A, who succeeded him as a pharaoh. The tomb's chambers were packed to the brim with more than 5,000 artifacts, including furniture, chariots, clothes, weapons, and 130 of the king's walking sticks. A 24 pound solid gold mask was placed over him and he was laid in a series of containers, three golden coffins and a granite sarcophagus. His death still has scientists scratching their heads. Also, look up how many archeologists died months after the cursed tomb had been raided. Yeah, you don't wanna know. At number five, harsh truth. Life is hard. No one really tells you that when you're a kid. Well, at least not these days. Back during the reign of the Aztec civilization, kids were taught from day one that life was not going to be easy for them. From the moment a baby was born, they were told that life was pain, you know, so that they knew exactly what they were getting themselves into. In Aztec culture, as soon as a baby was born, the midwife would take the baby in their arms and tell them the truth about life. They would look the newborn in the eyes as part of their religious tradition and tell the child, quote, life is an affliction, end quote. To really make the point of how tough that kid's life is gonna be, the midwife also promised the child that they would, quote, die a horrible and violent death, either in war or as human sacrifice, end quote. Sounds like quite the life. At number four, stretch the kids. 
We all know that over time we grow, right? It's just a fact of life. We start off as little babies and we grow into big adults and whatnot. Well, the Aztecs kind of knew this, but didn't quite understand the whole concept of growth. They knew that people grew, but they thought that it was a manual thing and that they had to stretch their kids by hand to make sure that they grew to be big and tall. And no, I'm not making this up. They actually stretched their kids. In their culture, Aztec parents would hold ceremonies called the stretching of people to make them grow. I know, catchy name, right? During this stretching ceremony, they would take the kid by the neck and just dangle them in the air, letting gravity do its thing, and then they would move on to pulling on their arms and legs to stretch them out a bit to make sure that every part grew evenly. I have no idea where this thought to stretch their kids came from, but I do know that Aztecs were obsessed with making sure that their kids grew tall. So I mean, if pulling a stretch Armstrong on little Timmy helped him grow an extra inch, then to each their own, I guess. At number three, discipline. This is probably one of the wildest forms of discipline I have ever heard of, and I would not recommend that you try this on your own kids because this is absolutely brutal, but then again, the Aztecs were some pretty brutal people, so it's only fitting that they start off at a young age. Aztec parents did not take any kind of lip from their kids. No one was misbehaving on their watch. Now, the disciplinary actions that the kids received varied depending on their age. If they were under the age of 11, then the naughty children would be poked with spines from a cactus, and if they were really bad, then they would be covered in those spines. But for kids over the age of 11, their punishments for being lazy or misbehaving were so much worse than being poked with cactus spines. Instead, they would hold their kid over burning chili peppers in a fireplace, making them breathe in the fumes. This was a very harsh punishment, but that was the life of an Aztec. Harsh from the get-go. At number two, mandatory dance party. Another pretty odd thing that the Aztecs did was they held mandatory late night dance parties. Yeah, they basically had raves that everyone had to attend. This all night dance party was essentially the only way that young Aztec boys and girls could socialize because apart from these social gatherings, they were separated at school. These dance parties gave them a chance to socialize and also learn about their culture as it gave the adults an opportunity to share stories with the youngest generation of Aztecs. They would spend the whole night learning about religion and philosophy through songs played at the dance party. And the young Aztecs would also learn to flirt with one another since it was their only opportunity to. I think that out of all of the weird facts about Aztec culture, this is actually pretty cool because I've never heard of a culture having mandatory dance parties before. That's actually pretty awesome. And finally at number one, skull racks. Now moving on from something groovy to something rather spooky, we have Aztec skull racks. If you were to visit large city centers and temples at the height of the Aztec civilization, then you would have been greeted by a rather scary sight. Racks upon racks of human skulls estimated to be as large as 200 feet long and 100 feet wide. These racks featured the skulls of thousands of sacrificial victims. These racks were there to honor the gods to whom these victims had been sacrificed, as well as to demonstrate the city's power. I'm sure that if you walked into a big city and saw thousands of skulls lined up like that, you would be a little afraid too, right? The Spanish conquistadors were certainly frightened the first time they set eyes on the skull racks, and they documented every frightening emotion, making sure that we all knew just how frightening the Aztecs really were. Kicking off our list at number 10, the Dendera Light. Here we go, going back to ancient aliens, maybe, who knows. The Dendera Light is a controversial image found in the Temple of Hathor in Dendera, Egypt. Now some theories suggest that this image here depicts an ancient Egyptian light bulb or some advanced electrical technology of some sorts, which is pretty exciting. However, mainstream Egyptologists interpret it as a symbolic representation of religious concepts. That makes more sense than ancient Egyptian light brights, I guess. I guess, it's not as fun, but sure, checks out. The bulb is more likely a depiction of the lotus flower, and the central figure holding a snake is associated with the creation myths. So yeah, there's some history there. There's some tea behind. There's some stuff you have to know. The Dendera light is a subject of debate and speculation to this day, of course, because people want to believe that this is aliens, an alien light show. But there's currently no concrete evidence to support the claim that this represents ancient Egyptian knowledge of electricity or advanced lighting technology of sorts. Again, part of me wants to believe in ancient light bulbs, but maybe I've been playing too much Zelda. That's probably it. That's probably that, maybe. I don't know. Number nine, beer. 
yeah, it's some pretty good stuff coming up next. Ancient Egyptians, they brewed and consumed beer on a daily basis. Now, they considered it a staple of their diet. Cool, me too, I guess. Beer production was primarily a household activity with everybody in the family helping the process, which is great. That's, what does your family taste like? Let's do it. The brewing techniques here involved fermenting grains, barley, and flavoring the beer with dates, honey, and spices, and pretty much anything you wanted. It's your brew. Get creative, throw, throw random shit in there. See how it tastes. Why not? It's ancient Egypt. Beer had both religious and social significance. Beer would be offered to deities and consumed during festivals and gatherings. Give a, a deity a Coors Light. You're like, here you go. This ought to cool you down. Rocky Mountain certified, buddy. Stop yelling, stop cursing our lands. It also provided hydration, nutrition, and a means of socializing in ancient Egyptian society. So hard to say no to that. Twist my arm, please. Number eight, curses. Of course, these are, these are real. These are very real. And you'll get cursed if you don't hit that thumbs up. Ancient Egyptian curses are a subject of fascination and speculation, of course. Curses were believed to be supernatural powers wielded by priests or individuals to protect sacred sites and or tombs from desecration. These curses often warned of dire consequences for anyone who disturbed the resting place of a pharaoh or violated these sacred spaces at all. The curses were typically inscribed on tomb walls or objects and invoked the wrath of gods and spirits. Ergo, don't touch my sh Thanks. Many inscriptions contain symbolic threats rather than the direct supernatural actions. So the curse of the pharaohs is mainly associated with King Tut. This curse gained attention when several individuals involved in the excavation of Tut's tomb just died unexpectedly. However, these deaths can be attributed to natural causes or coincidences, of course. But the timing here was a little, it's a little cursed. Nobody really knows, right? We wanna believe. Maybe it's fun to believe. That way we won't steal things from the dead, right? Let's go that way. Number seven, a pet hippo. Are you a dog person? Are you a cat person? How about hippos? They're fun. They'll maybe eat you, who knows? Real quick, do you have any idea how fast hippos are? I had no clue my entire life. I thought they were fat and fun and stationary. No, hippos can run as fast as 50 kilometers an hour. Their bite is three times as powerful as the bite of a lion's. Yeah, so you shouldn't fuck with them. You shouldn't fuck with them with the pH. <laughs> the Pharaoh Menes was Egypt's first pharaoh. We refer to him as the lost pharaoh because, well, for starters, he was alive a very long time ago, 3000 BC, don't know much about him, but also he was killed by his pet hippo, therefore definitely lost. We lost him fast, fast and loud. This king spent over 60 years on the throne, and after all of that, all the wars and conquests and all the treaties, after all that, a hippo got him. What a shame. I mean, to be fair, I don't think there's a harder way to go out as a king. A hippo kills you? I don't know. That's pretty badass. That's like top three coolest ways to die next to like the Megalodon. I don't know. Number six, Israel Sphinx Claws. Ah, here we go. Some ancient Wolverine stuff coming in here. The mystery of the Sphinx Claws in Israel. This refers to a set of large limestone claws that were of course discovered near the city of Tel Hazor. Now these claws resemble feline paws of some sort. They're very sharp, very large, very intimidating, and they're believed to have once been part of a Sphinx sculpture. So if someone just took a little bit home with them, that's always nice. The origin and purpose of these claws of course remain uncertain. Now some theories suggest that they were brought from Egypt or represent the influence of Egyptian culture in the region. One of the two. Someone stole it or someone was inspired. One of the two. Others propose alternative explanations such as symbolic or decorative elements. However, without further evidence or historical context, we don't really know because this was, I don't know, 3,000 years ago. Where do these hands come from? They're scary, but we'll never know. It is fascinating. I just wanted to show you these cool hands. Number five, when in Rome. Having a large quantity of warships in your harbor with shiny new weapons and technology is bad for one's health. But worse than that, it puts you in a position to be colonized. And to be fair, there was a good chance of that happening. From multiple nations actually. So when given an ultimatum, it was time to make a decision. But perhaps this wasn't all bad. The Japanese actually came up with a rather good solution. What if we take all the new technology and run with it? Maybe it's time to colonize some places ourselves, thought a room full of people ready to overthrow the feudal government with modern technology. And that's exactly what they did. An event in Japanese history called the Meiji Restoration was just that. What's unholy about the whole thing is how fast they did it, restoring the imperial reign but at the same time making it a very modern one. Within a few years it had become the most powerful superpower in Asia. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. Number 4. The Last Samurai Japan went from feudal kingdoms to an imperial powerhouse maybe too quickly. Samurai for the longest time were a part of Japanese nobility. 
swords were hired that became so rich and powerful that they essentially became the government themselves. So when the Meiji Restoration came about, the use of knights for hire really wasn't necessary with an imperial army and government. Tensions rose as a samurai rebellion had broken out. The samurai of the old world with traditional weapons, some firearms, and the new and powerful imperial Japanese army with modern weapons and lots of soldiers. After imperial Japanese victory, Japan would shortly begin its expansion and colonization of Asia, taking the stage as a major world player. Number 3. Stomach Pains if you know anything about Japanese history, you knew this was coming. No, not the Logan Paul incident, but seppuku, the tradition of unaliving yourself with the most pain possible. Look, you gotta give samurai credit. They follow that Bushido code to the T. I mean, I can't even commit to a good book sometimes. But as crazy as the tradition sounds to us, to the samurai, honor means everything. Often done when defeated or disgraced, it's a ritual knife to the belly, and see you soon in the afterlife, oh mighty emperor. The most well known case of this was the tale of the 47 Ronin, who, after being disgraced and avenging their master, were granted seppuku by the shogun. The story has been told in many plays and even some films. Number two, tis but a scratch, sir. Katanas are beautiful pieces of art in warfare. Just ask anyone at an anime convention, they'll tell you. But in all seriousness, a lot of time and effort goes into constructing a samurai blade. One might even say the blacksmith's soul gets put into every strike of his hammer. So when the blade is completed, you gotta test drive it. Make sure it's sharp. To test the sharpness of a samurai edge, you would use bamboo, animals, and the occasional criminal. This practice was called Tameshigiri. That's right. They would test it on people. But I mean, what better way to know what your sword is gonna do than by knowing what it's going to do? Katanas could easily remove limbs from torsos. Records of these events have provided some knowledge of the human body's resistance to edge weapons. Thanks, Samurai. And number one, artsy brothels. Geisha women wore beautiful kimono robes and were oftentimes mistaken for being courtesans. While in some cases that is true about geishas, they were more like me. Wait, what? All jokes aside, they were more humble hosts for these pleasure quarters, <laughs> oftentimes entertaining men before the scandalous behavior occurred. This was a time of great cultural and artistic expansion in Japan. So these pleasure houses were legal. A lot of these women, while not having the same amount of freedom and choice as today, actually did have more than their European counterparts. Nice. Number 10. The Sins of Our Fathers Law and Order is not just a hit drama from the 90s with a killer soundtrack but something that started with the civilizations a very long time ago. King Hammurabi and his code of law comes to mind. But today, we're talking about ancient Persia. We're talking about a corrupt judge named Sisimans. After taking a bribe and delivering a not so unbiased verdict, the king found out and was most displeased. This is one of the worst things to do to another human being, but poor Sisimans was flayed. Or in simpler terms, they done skinned that feather alive. To make an unholy situation even more uncomfortable, they made a chair and used his hide as a material and made his son sit in the flesh chair to make his own judgments. Can't help but think that you'd be sitting there all day thinking of dear old dad because you're sitting on top of a chair that's kind of fuzzy because dad had a lot of back hair. Yikes. Number nine, the annual purge. I don't know about you folks at home, but I love the holiday season. For me specifically, Christmas. And to me, the meaning of Christmas is something less to do with religious background, but just good cheer. Spending time with loved ones and friends, and really enjoying a nice homemade meal. I mean, come on, turkey with a stuffing. <laughs> can't go wrong there. And honestly, you can't beat a good stuffing. I love it. But looking back at ancient Persia, there was a different kind of holiday. One that also has its roots in uh, less about religion and more about cold-blooded killings. There were Zoroastrian priests called the Magi, and although they weren't Persian, they were somewhat respected in Persian culture. But when a plot to overthrow the king was enacted, the Persians were not too happy, and slaughtered the people responsible for the coup. But just for good measure, they also slaughtered all the other priests in the palace. Okay, but they might have missed some outside in the city and they had to get them too. You know what, how about every year on this day we go on a magi hunt? So it became a holiday. Every year on the day of the coup, there was a grand feast and then a hunt for the remaining survivors. That's really comforting, that's nice. Number eight, poaching. It's 2021, we all know it's super uncool to poach. Illegally hunting endangered species for fun or just one sought after piece of the animal like elephant tusks for ivory. Our Persian friends of the past just might have been partaking in the poaching of rhinos. While in the ancient world the laws of today were not around to protect animals, the reason was still there and people wanted horns. 
For some reason, however, people thought that rhino horn held the power to purify water. Thus, it was used to detect poisonous liquids. It's a superstitious belief that actually would be carried on for a very long time. Rhino horn did have other uses in civilizations, but I like to think it was a coolness factor. You can't tell me drinking wine out of a hollowed out horn isn't cool. Come on. Number seven, Marvin's room. Hey man, it's okay. We've all been there. We all felt that kind of hurt before. You're drunk, it's 3 a.m. in a big city with lights. She hurt you bad, dude. But you should just call her. Just see if she picks up. Maybe you shouldn't. Maybe you should get really drunk and then come up with a solution and then see if it still sounds like a solid plan in the morning when you're sober. Yeah, when ancient Persians had a big decision to make, they used dad wisdom. Get super drunk and then think about critical events in life that require tough decision making. And when you're sober in the morning, do it drunk you thought. Being honest was a big part of Persian culture. And when are people at their most honest? So the theory kind of makes sense to me. I just know that when I wake up in the morning after nurturing a case of beer, that last night's thoughts don't always translate well in the morning. Number six, the land of milk and honey. Another creative punishment for the people who want to lose sleep tonight, a punishment for crimes Persians had come up with was scapism. This is where the Persians would feed a convicted criminal milk and honey. Sounds awesome, right? Well, not exactly. See, they entrapped the person between two boats. And every day, they would force feed someone milk and honey. Milk and honey, milk and honey. Over and over and over again. Also, slathering the mixture of the two on the poor helpless criminal. As time went on, flies and bugs would find themselves interested in a sweet smelling crook. As one must also use the bathroom after all that beautiful rich consumption. A true horror to see, but after enough time, the person who was unlucky enough to be in such a position slowly and painfully died in a bog of their own filth and rodent infested area. Most likely dying of septic shock. I don't even I don't even have a joke for this one. This is something that should just be in the next Saw movie. Ugh. Number five, Horus and Set. Speaking of Horus, earlier, remember how I said Horus had to take over defending his father? Well, here is where this story begins. When Horus grew up to be a man, he pulled a Hamlet. He was like, you killed my father, prepare to die. Thus, a series of battles ensued, and one of the gods didn't play fair. Set kept cheating at everything and continued to come out as victor. Not surprising since he didn't earn his way on the throne, he killed for it, kind of like a certain Claudius. Eventually Isis stepped up to help her son slash nephew overcome her brother. She set a trap for Set, but after some pitiless begging for his own life, she let him go. Horus was pissed, so angry some of the other gods got upset that he was so angry. They agreed to compete in a final boat race and Horus was like crushing it. He was doing really well, he was about to win. But then of course, Set cheated by turning into a hippopotamus and attacked the boat. Therefore claiming victory once again. Osiris finally showed up and declared that no man should take the throne through murder. So Horus took the throne. Why Osiris didn't just settle the whole deal from the beginning is confusing in itself, but hey, kinda remind me of the eagles that showed up at the end of Lord of the Rings that could have saved like three movies, you know? Kinda like that. Anyways, let's move on. Number four, Ra and his boat. Ra is one of the most revered gods in Egyptian mythology, especially since he was the god of the sun. He was depicted as a man with the head of a falcon. That kind of makes sense. He was once the greatest of all gods, but had to take a step back after he got too old and tired, and especially considering his task, I can see why. His job was to drive away darkness and sail across the skies, delivering light wherever he went. But at night, he would dive into the underworld and have to cross 12 gates. 12 hours, an hour per gate. After paying his respect to Osiris every night, a giant snake named Apophis tried to attack and swallow the boat. Every night! Poor guy, no wonder he got worn out. Every day it got harder to defend, and even one night, Apophis succeeded, but could only hold the sunlight for so long. She threw it up, which explained solar eclipses. After Set was cast out after the whole nephew battle, he ended up serving Ra in his boat and kept the snake at bay. But there's something confusing coming later that I think you'll agree is very confusing. So here we go. Coming up next, we have Bass, number three. Have you ever had a cat look you up and down and kind of like expect something? like worship, you know? Are you a cat person, dog person? Let me know in the comments. Well, that's because cats were a big deal in Egyptian mythology. They even had their own goddess. Bastet was a cat goddess depicted as a woman with a cat's head. Cats had a meaningful role in ancient Egypt as they protected their food from rats and snakes. They were even seen as family members and to harm one was punishable by death. 
Legend says that sometimes cats would enter burning buildings to save their families. If they died, the goddess would bring them back to life, hence the idea of cats having nine lives. There it is. Now here's where things get confusing. You know that story I told about Ra? Well apparently Bastet was in the boat with him as well. During the day she would ride with him, and at night she would turn into a cat and then defend the boat from Apophis the snake. But I thought that was set. So many conflicting things. I saw like a couple different stories who said each thing was different, so who knows. Number two, Jeb and Nut. Yet another sibling partnership, we have Jeb and Nut. They fell deeply in love and could never be separated. They were that couple who would like constantly be like, oh my god, stop, right next to each other at dinner, you know what I mean? Jeb was the god of the earth and Nut was the god of the sky. A previously mentioned god, Atum, found their union inappropriate, so he pushed Nut into the sky far away from Jeb. He just didn't like being a third wheel. Jeb and Nut were close enough to see each other, but could never hold each other again. And she gave birth to Osiris. Isis, Set, and Nephthys. Some say Horus too, but I don't think that's true. Number one, the treasure thief. Okay, I don't know how I feel about the story, okay? This doesn't really feel like harmony is in balance, but anyways. The treasure thief ends in a way I really didn't expect and I'm not sure you will either. Long ago, a great pharaoh with a wealth of riches decided to build a pyramid in which to keep them safe. One of the builders was wise to his plan and decided to find a way to claim them for himself. He built a stone vault with a hidden entrance covered by a slab so he could get to the riches. But unfortunately, he fell ill before he could return, so he told his sons of his plan. The sons headed to the pyramid in the dead of night, following their father's order, but unbeknownst to them, the pharaoh had laid booby traps and one brother was caught in one. Not wanting to be found or interrogated, revealing his other brother, he told his brother to chop his head off. Ugh, that he did. Loyalty? I don't know. The pharaoh upon finding the body hung it up in the town square in the hopes of like weeding out whoever it belonged to. But the other brother being so clever got the guards drunk and stole back his brother's body in the dead of night. The pharaoh was like, I'm not even mad. I'm just impressed. He gave the thief a pardon, summoned him to the square and gave his daughter to marry him. Yeah, dude, you tried to steal my jewels? Don't worry about it. Have my daughter, because you're so talented at your job. Great work. Kicking off our list at number 10, the London Tornado. We've all heard about the Great Fire of London in 1666. So let's talk about another horrible event from history, shall we? That's why I'm here, after all. On October 16th, 1091, harsh winds from the southwest took out more than 600 houses and a handful of churches. There was a mighty tornado. The Church of St. Mary was a rather unholy place to be on that specific day. The tornado killed two men in this building and it tore up the roof and timbers went everywhere. The rafters were actually ripped from the structure, then slammed down far away back into the earth. Turns out historically about half of these rafters were buried in the dirt. That's how much force was thrashing them about. Tornadoes are so scary. I feel a strong wind outside and I'm immediately back inside. That's it. I'm shaking in my boots. I don't mess with wind. Number nine, the great drowning of men. Such a tragic name, my lord. How about we take out the word great and all these references maybe. I don't know. It's kind of horrible. In the Middle Ages, coastal areas around the North Sea were hot spots for flooding. Now, historically, there were numerous reports of flooding here, and for some reason, between the 11th and 15th centuries, this area would get absolutely destroyed. It would get completely swamped, and it's even larger than you can possibly imagine. The St. Marcellus flood took place on January 16th, 1362. Now, the death toll here, I mean, obviously, it's impossible to tell for sure, but historians believe it was at least 25,000 people. That's horrible. Atlantic gales were to blame for the rush of water because this event also goes hand in hand with the great wind of 1362. The great wind, awesome. The mighty wind, like it's not great at all. It's not really good. Number eight, one name. This next one here blows my mind. I never really thought about this before, but what was it like before we had surnames? Surnames were introduced to us in England in 1066, but before then, well, you were just Greg, period. That's it. There was another Greg, well, that was it. Now you guys had to fight till the death. No, I'm just kidding. At first, surnames names were a little bit different. They were descriptions almost about the person you were meeting. So you'd meet a guy and he would say, hey, I'm Greg Red 
Red signified his red hair. Makes sense. Greg Red, Greg Gray, he's getting a little old. Got it, Gregs, we're good. But the best part, your name could actually change over time because your description and then your appearance would also change. So one day you would meet Greg Red, but eventually his hair would fall out, he would age, then get stressed because, you know, he's living in the medieval times and all. And then once that happens, your name would change to match your new description. Now you're Greg Ball. Ball back then meant bald in Middle English, so everyone had the last name Ball. Isn't that amazing? Next video, I'll be Taylor Ball. I'll just be bald. Why not? Just change it up like Heisenberg. Number seven, medieval meals. Ah, yes. I hope you're eating while you're watching this. If so, give it a thumbs up, take a big bite, and good luck. Seeing as the holidays just passed, I figured there's no better time to mention a medieval holiday tradition. I'm glad we don't do this one anymore. This one's pretty gross. Swans today, they're beautiful. We see them traveling in pairs, and we don't hunt them down because, well, that would be insane, right? Medieval days, swans were hot property. They were a delicacy of the upper classes. Christmas swan pie. Nice, here you go. For you and yours. Enjoy. Merry Christmas. I would be crying on Christmas Day if I saw this on the table. They would actually stuff swans with beef, which I personally don't recommend. Turkeys, I'm like, okay, that we've dealt with. Swans, I'm like, no. But they were in love. They mate for life. Do we eat both? Let's eat both, I guess. Other medieval meals included peacocks, cranes, turtle doves, sparrows, and herons. Herons? Imagine Christmas dinner is a heron lying on the table. You're like, Really, Dad? I don't really want to eat this. This is a long, the long neck. Number six, the dancing plague. Okay, summer 1518, a summer we will never forget, sadly. One of the most bizarre events in medieval history, the dancing plague. The town of Strasbourg was calm, cool, and or collect until out of nowhere, one woman began to dance dance uncontrollably in the streets. She was convulsing, it was wild, but then soon others join in and eventually there were over 400 people dancing their days away. Now it sounds funny in some degree, but it's really tragic. This was not a good time at all. A great amount lost their lives due to pure exhaustion and heart attacks and the authorities tried their best to help the situation so they paid for musicians to perform for them while they danced, while they were convulsing. They're like, oh yes, bring in a jazz band. Let's complete this image. This happened a few times in Europe, not just once. Between the 14th and the 17th centuries, we still don't know what exactly happened, but there were dance plagues. It was a common occurrence. All we know is that it was some sort of illness. It was not like step up. It wasn't a fun thing like step up at all. No one's just popping and locking in the streets. They're like, hey, nice. Let's bring in some music. This is great. No, people were very sick. They were very ill from the 11th dynasty. Tucked away in Luxor, Egypt, of course, as this list says. Spanish archaeologists found a tomb belonging to a leader from the 11th dynasty. And it's pretty obvious that this was somebody from the royal family or somebody who was a high ranking official because at the time, Luxor was the capital city of ancient Egypt. And officials also believe this tomb could have been used as a mass grave. The important thing to note here is that the tomb had also been used during the 17th dynasty because tools and utensils from that later time were also found in this grave. We're gonna find a spork in 5,000 years and be like, ah yes, ancient tools, interesting. Number four, 210 sarcophagi. So we thought it was a pretty big deal when 160 bodies were recently discovered in Egypt. This was back in September 2020. Over 160 coffins were found. Wild, right? Well, those are rookie numbers, turns out. For this one, archaeologists found 210 sarcophagi near Queen Nefertiti's funerary temple in the city of the dead, Saqqara. Yeah, there were over 160, surprise. Maybe next time you check in with us, that number will be even higher. Who knows? Hopefully, slash maybe hopefully not. I don't know how I feel about this. This was January 2021. We probably would have seen it on the news, but that was when 768 people were storming the capital, so the news was a bit busy, I guess. Thanks. These sealed coffins were untouched for thousands of years. They went from finding 160 to finding 210. That's incredible. According to the ministry, the sarcophagi were completely closed and haven't been opened since they were buried at all. They opened a few though, of course, just to analyze and display them, but that's it. Yeah, leave the rest. I'm not focused on ancient curses or Brennan Fraser having to come out and save the day. Just let dead people lay where they are. Let them rest. The amount of effort got into hiding and preserving their memory alone. I mean, look how long it's taken for us to even find these things. It's almost like they didn't want to be found. Number three, the ancient curse. The walls of some of these tombs have warnings from the gods, which is a lot. One of them warning trespassers that the gods will wring their neck like that of a goose. Also, if I walked into somebody's property now and it said trespassers necks will be wrung out like a goose, I would turn back. I wouldn't want to investigate further. I would just walk away. You don't need to be an ancient god to get that message across, you know what I mean? But inside the found tomb of the vizier Enkimor, a pharaoh's official from 4,000 years ago, a curse was written. Buried in a mastaba, an above ground massive tomb, was this warning. 
might do against this, my tomb, the same shall be done to your property. It also warns of the vizier's knowledge of secret spells and magic, and threatens to fill impure intruders with a fear of seeing a ghost. Yeah, there's that, or beware of dog. I don't know, you can pick which is more impactful on your property, sure. Number two, the animal tombs. This tomb was found, as you may have guessed, in the Valley of the Kings. You're getting good, nice. But this one doesn't sound like the rest. I mean, for starters, it's a number rather than a name. What in the Elon Musk is happening here? Whose name was a number, huh? KV-52 was discovered in 1906 by Edward Ayrton. Tomb KV-50, KV-51, and this one, KV-52, they all form a group referred to as the animal tombs. Underneath six feet of debris, the entrance to these vaults were found, so when we enter this tomb, specifically KV-52, that's been untouched, ideally, for thousands of years, we can look forward to finding anything. In fact, whatever we do find, it's a win. It helps complete this age-long puzzle. So when officials opened KV-52 and it was completely empty, well, that doesn't feel too nice. Something here is wrong. It was empty except for two boxes. Both were black and undecorated, which is odd considering what we've learned on this list. The larger of the two contained the remains of a monkey, and the smaller one was a canopic chest that had four compartments in it. Hauntingly bare compared to what else we've seen on this list, but it gets a little better. We're not done yet. Finally, number one, Queen Nefertiti's Hidden Chamber. When researchers are 90% sure about something, that's a pretty good sign. You only say you're 90% sure of something when you know for sure, for sure. You leave 10% in case anything else goes wrong out of your control, right? 90%, that's confident, we got this. So when Egyptian authorities said they're 90% sure there's a hidden chamber in King Tut's tomb, well, we got a little jazzed, a little, got some jazz hands going on. Not gold, jazz hands. Back in 2015, a paper was published on the burial of Queen Nefertiti. Archaeologist Nicholas Reeves argued that while conducting scans on the ancient site, Reeves found what resembled traces of doors beneath the plaster. Now, it's been considered previously by archaeologists that King Tut's mask, having ear piercings and all, suggests that at that time, that tomb and that death mask was actually meant for Queen Nefertiti, not King Tut. But because King Tut died suddenly when he was 19, plans had to quickly change. 90% sure is good enough for me. What do you guys think? Comment down below all your thoughts. At number 10, the creation. Every religion and civilization from the dawn of humanity has come up with their own unique stories as to how the world was created. Some civilizations have credited aliens, others have credited a benevolent god, and many of these gods have their own unique ways of creating life. Though we've heard stories of gods creating people out of things like corn or mud or just thin air, I don't think these stories could even compare to the ancient Egyptian story of creation. These ancient people believed that their very first god, Atum, created himself. As such, he had no wife and literally no one else to potentially procreate with, and so to create his and thus create humanity, he, well, he busted it. Literally, he just gave himself a one to meat massage and boom. Out of that process, he created his kids, Shu and Tefnut. A very fitting name, if you ask me. This legend, I guess you could say, created the term the God's Hand. And this was used to refer to women back in ancient Egypt, since Atum's hand played the quote unquote female role in the creation of his offspring. This term was also carried over into other civilizations, like in the Greco Roman period. So if you ever hear someone say God's Hand, now you know where that came from. At number nine, cheating death. These days, if you get caught cheating on your partner, the worst that could happen to you is you break up, or you get a divorce, or maybe even get exposed on social media. But back in the times of ancient Egypt, the punishment for adultery was much, much worse than having your relationship end. Instead, your life would be the thing that ends. Obviously, in any civilization, any kind of relationship can always happen outside of a marriage. The only varying difference is the punishment for it. For the ancient Egyptians, being caught having an adulterous relationship was punishable by death. Pretty harsh for having a sneaky link, but I guess they took their relationships much more seriously back then. One of the most famous cases of a serial adulterer, if you will, came from a man named Peneb, who was known to sleep with many married women and even had his own son join in on his escapades too. As you can imagine, things didn't really end well for them, so if you ever go back in time to ancient Egypt, just be careful of who you sleep with. Before we continue talking about some of the things that your teachers might not have taught you about ancient Egypt, why not leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number eight, ancient WAP. Last year, there was a huge scandal concerning Cardi B and Meg Thee Stallion's song WAP. It's a pretty racy song that had a lot of people up in arms about it, and it was all over the news. 
I mean, if you ever heard any songs from the early 2000s, then you would know that this kind of musical content really isn't a new thing. And Little songs have been a part of society for a really long time, but it might surprise you to know that they even had some risque songs even back in the times of ancient Egypt. Historians have discovered some of these songs, one of which I can recite to you, and it uses some pretty imaginative wording to describe a woman's body. In an excerpt from said song, it says, quote, The one, the sister without peer, the handsomest of all. She looks like the rising morning star. At the start of a happy year, shining bright, fair of skin, love the look of her eyes, sweet the speech of her lips, she has not a word too much. Upright neck, shining breast, her hair true lapis lazuli, arms surpassing gold, fingers like lotus buds, heavy thighs, and narrow waist, her legs parade her beauty. With graceful steps she treads the ground, captures my heart with her movement." End quote. Now, it's no wop, but for the ancient Egyptians, it was pretty spicy. Item number seven, the ancient hub. Back in ancient times, people needed some spicy content to make themselves happy, you know? Before we had only fans and the hub, people in ancient Egypt had their own adult content to enjoy during their alone time. This piece of content was called the Turin Papyrus, and it was essentially just a scroll of a bunch of images on it with people getting busy in some frankly unimaginable positions. Like, I don't know when the Kama Sutra was created, but I feel like the Turin Papyrus certainly gave it a run for its money. The purpose of this papyrus is pretty much unknown, but there are some theories to explain its origin and why it was created, some thinking that it had political ties or something. Either way, historians use this document to further understand times in ancient Egypt. At number six, magic attraction. You know, we can't always have the best game when it comes to finding a partner. Sometimes it can be hard to get someone to go out with you. Many people just don't give up until they succeed, and sometimes that means that they will go to many lengths just to get a date with their crush. This was seen a lot in ancient Egypt, and at one point in later years of their civilization, they practiced magic to attract the one that they loved. Turns out that they practiced voodoo to get someone interested in them, and it was commonly done by men seeking out the woman of their dreams. In one case of this voodoo for love practice, a man had a magician make a voodoo doll of a woman that he wanted all to himself. The magician pierced the figurine with bronze nails and inscribed a tablet on it with a spell saying that this woman would not be able to drink, eat, or be with another man besides the one seeking her out. The spell also supposedly summoned a demon to follow her and pull her hair and intestines until she found her way to him. Sounds a little intense, but hey, I guess that's just what you do when you don't have Tinder. At number five, Popova. Just about every civilization has their interpretation of Earth's origins. Some cultures believe that cosmic beings made the Earth, others believed in various gods and various motivations for creating life. One ancient text that was discovered by researchers tells the story of the Maya and their belief of how the world was created. This ancient text known as Popova, which ultimately is translated to Book of Council, is a mythical origin story. According to the tales written in this ancient text, the forefather gods, quote, brought forth the earth from a watery void and endowed it with animals and plants, end quote. The text also describes how the gods had difficulties making humans and tells the story of how they created two heroes twins who went on a series of adventures and even defeated the Lord of the Underworld. The earliest surviving copy of Popova dates back to 1701, but it is believed that there were earlier copies of the text that might not have been found or have been lost. At number 4, Copper Scroll. Next up, let's talk about another ancient text that discusses the existence of a large treasure. An ancient Hebrew text called the Copper Scroll was found in a cave in the Judean desert. This ancient text is believed to contain recorded details of a vast treasure that may include gold, silver, vessels, and coins. The Copper Scroll dates back to sometime around 70 CE, which coincides with a time when the Roman army laid siege to Jerusalem and the Second Temple, a Jewish holy temple which stood on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, was destroyed. Researchers are still unsure if these treasures described in the Copper Scroll actually exist, as it is still highly debated. Even if these treasures really did exist, it could have already been found back in ancient times, but even still, no treasure as large as the one described in the scroll have been found in Israel or Palestine. 
At number three, Dresden Codex. For researchers, being able to find ancient texts is very exciting because it can teach them a lot about a civilization, its people, and their beliefs. However, they're often pretty hard to come by due to a number of reasons like poor preservation, warfare, looting, and more. In the case of the Mayans, many of their artifacts and written documents were believed to have been destroyed by Christian missionaries trying to wipe out any non-Christian beliefs, so when one of their ancient texts is found, it's a pretty big deal. When the Dresden Codex was found, it was a huge accomplishment for researchers. The Dresden Codex is an ancient Mayan document that dates back 800 years and contains 39 sheets of text with beautifully drawn images and text on both sides. Researchers done on this codex indicate that it is a record of the phases of the planet Venus so that the Maya, quote, would be certain that their ceremonial events were being held on the correct day. End quote. The codex first appeared in Germany in 1730, but no one really knows how it got there. At number two, Voynich Manuscript. Now, this next ancient text is pretty mysterious simply because no one can read it. Dun dun dun. That's right, the Voynich Manuscript, a 250 page book containing illustrations of plants, cosmological symbols, and naked ladies is carbon dated to have originated sometime in the 15th century. It also contains unreadable text. This book was first discovered in 1912 by an antique book dealer and since then the text in the book has yet to have been deciphered. There is speculation amongst researchers that suggests that perhaps the language in this book is a lost language or code or perhaps just gibberish. However, a recent study of the book's language suggests that it does have the hallmarks of a real language. You know what I think the Voynich manuscript is an alien document. Think about it. Aliens came to Earth and they documented what they saw, like native plant species and humans, hence the drawings of women, because come on, how can you not be obsessed with women? Right? And these cosmological symbols found in the book would also be tied to the aliens because of course they're from outer space. But what do you guys think? And finally, at number one, Handbook of Ritual Power. Saving the best and most mysterious ancient text for last, we have the Handbook of Ritual Power. This is a 20 page ancient codex that dates back around 1300 years and is written in Coptic. What's so interesting and mysterious about this little book is its contents. Within the 20 pages of this ancient book are magic spells and formulas, including love spells, spells for curing black jaundice, and even instructions on how to perform an exorcism. It's believed that this ancient text may have been written by a group of Sethians, an ancient Christian sect who praised Seth, the third son of Adam and Eve. What adds to the already mysterious contents of the book is the book's opening, as it references a mysterious unknown figure named Bactiotha. A translation of the opening text of the handbook reads, quote, I give thanks to you and I call upon you the Bactiotha, the great one who is very trustworthy, the one who is lord over the forty and the nine kinds of serpents. End quote. The book is now housed in a museum in Sydney after they purchased it from an antiquities dealer in Vienna. How this dealer acquired the book though remains unknown. Kicking off the list at number 10, eye patches. Okay, perhaps one of the most notable features of a pirate has to be the old eye patch. If you're a pirate for Halloween and you don't have the eye patch, well, you just look like a hipster. Like, what are you? We don't know. It matters. It's a noticeable detail. But why did so many pirates cover their eyes? Was it because they got poked by Blackbeard? No. You know when you get up in the middle of the night to go to the washroom, and then as soon as you turn the light on, you're blinded for a hot minute, you can't even see, your ears are ringing, you don't even know where you are? It takes your eyes 20 minutes to adjust to darkness, so pirates having to go from the deck to under the ship back and forth, they had to keep one eye in the dark. Or else they'd be covering their eyes for most of their shift, which you really can't have when you're running a tight ship. Nobody has the time for that, so cover your eyes and be blind half the time. At number nine, earrings. When you think about what a stereotypical pirate looked like, you probably think of tattered clothing, hats, maybe an eye patch, and earrings. While their style, though pretty odd, also had a purpose, specifically the earring. Pirates were very superstitious, and their earrings followed in their superstitions as well. There were a lot of different beliefs that pirates had about these earrings. Some pirates believed that it could somehow improve or even cure bad eyesight. Why? No clue. Maybe they thought that ears and eyes were connected or something. I mean, they do start with the same letter. Some pirates also believed that the precious metals that their earrings were made of possessed magical healing powers, so maybe that's why they believed that they would heal their eyes. They also thought that having pierced ears would help them with seasickness, and that having a gold earring would serve as some kind of protective talisman, and that if you wore one, you would be protected from drowning. Number eight, hooks. 
Growing up watching cartoons, I've seen many versions of Captain Hook or pirates that resemble a Captain Hook type of villain. They all have the eye patch, earrings, and to make them more menacing, they have hooks for hands. Dustin Hoffman scared the shit out of me growing up in the movie Hook. It's literally called Hook. What's up with this? Well, this wasn't a move by film studios. This was actually historically accurate. Back in those days, they didn't have advanced prosthetic limbs, and when you're sword fighting over loot, well, odds are you're gonna lose a hand or two at one point. These pirates actually got compensation, which is so funny to me, just imagining a pirate filling out an insurance form. That's funny, but they were Replacement tool was usually a hook or a peg leg. They would just replace your leg with a singular piece of wood. That was the best they could do back then, and it had to work. Another fun little fact, if you got injured, your payroll came out of everybody's collective treasure. So you better have that athletic stance down and dodge some swords or else you're getting some shame. A lot of shame coming your way. At number seven, walk the plank. I'm sure you have no doubt heard of the term walking the plank, right? It is the stereotypical pirate thing to do when you need to get rid of someone, if you know what I mean. Well, we've sort of been misled by this whole walking the plank thing because rather than it be a method of offing your buddy Joe for not following orders, it was actually used as a method of psychological torture. Now don't get me wrong, pirates had many other imaginative and gruesome ways of unaliving people, but walking the plank really wasn't one of them. It was actually a relatively relatively rare practice as pirates like to do their unaliving practices pretty swiftly. Rather than making their unlucky victim walk a plank into the ocean, the most common form of putting someone six feet under, so to speak, was through keel hauling. Keel hauling was where you tied someone to a rope, threw them into the water, and pulled them under the boat and up to the other side. Now you would think that this person could just hold their breath and then survive, but no, not really. Instead, the unlucky soul would be hitting up against the boat and getting shredded by the barnacles on the boat before coming up to the surface. I don't know about you, but after knowing that, I would much rather walk the plank. Number six, maps, books, and gold. Just as valuable as gold and silver, back in the day, maps were a treasure in itself. It kind of helps knowing where you're going, to be fair. Also, pirates need to remember where they left their treasure. You can't really rely on a drunken pirate's memory now, can you? These charts would be stolen, obviously, and in turn, these guys would go on a little national treasure Hans Zimmer pirate adventure. One map in particular from the 1680s, the Spanish Atlas, was stolen, and National Geographic called this stolen map extremely valuable pirate booty. So this treasure is still out there somewhere and somebody's got the directions. Knowledge was key. They didn't have Siri hanging out all day to answer navigational questions. They even had to steal books. Pirates stealing books, what a scene. Some of these pirate heists wouldn't even involve treasure. They would sword fight and just hope that the books on board were worth the battle. Imagine losing countless crew members and all you got is the captain's daily logs. Just sailing the high seas, roasting William Kidd's girl problems. You're like, what an idiot. Number five, wine time. When we think of ancient Greeks, we think of wine and parties and apparently naked exercise, right? But was it really a drunken festival of love all the time? I mean, hangovers are a thing, right? We need some recovery days. When did Gatorade get invented? I don't know, this is it's probably hard to keep up. Ancient Greeks actually rarely drank wine without diluting the hell out of it first. To water the wine, the ratio was four to one or five to two. Either way, it's, it's just water at that point. So you'll be hydrated, that's for sure, which is great, but you're not really getting drunk, so I don't know what the point was. Regular Joes would drink at taverns and the rich would throw house parties, so some things, of course, have stayed the same after all these years, but ancient Greeks believed that drinking undiluted wine could cause blindness or insanity. My friend, I think that's just called blacking out. I don't know, who knows? If you did happen to drink too much wine, the fourth century poet, Amphis, he's got your back. Best way to cure those ancient hangovers was to boil some cabbage. Nice, just what you wanna smell after a night out. And in order to keep the party going without embarrassing yourself off some sparkling Shiraz, the best way to party and stay sober was to bake and eat a pig's lung. That's the trick to never getting drunk in ancient Greek times. Again though, I think that was just eating food. I think eating food helps before you drink. Either way, if you're gonna drink, do so responsibly. Eat some pig lung and then you'll be good. Number four, bronze bowl. On a list of unusual things ancient Greeks did, I think it's fair to throw in the bronze or the brazen bull. There was a bronze sculpture, often in the shape of a bull. Yeah, obviously. Usually it was large enough to fit a person inside. Yeah, it's, I think I saw this in a Saw movie one time. That's how, you know it's, that's how you know it's good. Once the person was locked inside, a fire would then be set underneath this bronze bull, and then you could probably figure out the rest of that situation and what happens to the victim inside. We'll say victim inside, not person. Victim. Horrible, horribly, painfully 
it's, it's all bad. They engineered the bull so that when somebody screamed inside, it sounded like a bull's roar. That's haunting. That's actually really horrible. Every time I talk about this, I'm like, mm, this is real life. Real people did this. It was designed originally for Phalaris. He was a horrible ruler. He ruled around 560 BC, but the sculpture for Phalaris was built by Perilous, the guy who made the brazen bull. He was sadly the first victim. That's why you don't make torture devices, but I don't know. Number three, Greek statues. Okay, I'll lighten up the mood a little bit. The last one was a bit dark. We've all done this at one point. Maybe you're at a museum and you see a statue. It's right there in front of you. It's carved. It's pure beauty. It's massive. The warrior represented has like 15 abs. It's made of bronze, eight feet tall. The amount of detail gone into their body is jaw dropping. Truly, it's impressive. But did you know that ancient Greeks would make their, their, their bird uh, small on purpose? Uh? On purpose. Yeah, men who were well endowed were more often than not fools. They were foolish. Only They only ruled for lust, right? They were just craved fools with big birds. If you had a big brain, however, oh, you were the talk of the town. Ladies would whisper about you when you pass by in the street. Did you hear about Brian's big brain? Oh my God. He's got his dad's brain. Whenever an actor would play a fool on stage, they would be given a comedically large uh, setup. You know, that's how you know he's the villain or the fool, the bad guy in the scenario. The way we see these statues today meant that they had self-control and intelligence. I always thought they were just in a cold room when they were getting their stuff carved, but that's what this channel's for. History, but make it a little silly. Number two, the Battle of Marathon. Every New Year's, there's always that one guy on Facebook or Instagram who just becomes a runner just overnight. Just, they have a little squirt water belt thing that they, they shoot it, you know, the whole thing, the whole setup. And they train ideally for a marathon. That's the big thing that they talk about for an entire year, this marathon. What is a marathon? Was it a person or is it just a name for 42 kilometers? Well, it was actually a battle back in 490 BC. That's how it kicked off. Between ancient Greeks and Persian invaders sent by King Darius, the Persians arrived to Marathon. There was about 20,000 of them. And they arrived to punish the Greeks for supporting the Lonians, who revolted against the Persians. Now, the Greeks were outnumbered here at this point, but they attacked hard and they attacked fast. They took out 6,000 Persians and eventually they just fled the scene entirely. The number of Greek fighters lost was around 200, so far less casualties. The story of Phidippides came to be at this time. He ran the first ever marathon. He ran all the way from Marathon to Athens to deliver messages because Blackberry wasn't a thing, obviously. So some guys had to be like, you bet. <laughs> Imagine servers back then, they're like, would you want a large soda? You got. He was one of the Greek military men known as day long runners. He did six marathons back to back. My knees hurt just saying that, you know what I mean? So next time you see somebody on Facebook become a marathon runner, just post a link to this video and be like, you got it. You're almost, just do six in a row and you're good. Also do six in a row naked in the heat and you're good. And finally, number one, human sacrifice. Of course, we gotta end on something crazy like this. We found the remains of a 3000 year old skeleton in Greece. They found the skeleton on the side of Mount Lycaon, which historians know as the site of animal sacrifice for Zeus. I don't know why I pointed up, but probably not down or yeah, Zeus, he's up there, yeah. Ancient writers mentioned this site and how human sacrifice was also at play here. And now thanks to technology, we can confirm that this was for sure the case. We talked about zombies earlier and how bodies would be buried with like rocks in them and stuff. This is a bit different. This is actually much different. The upper part of the skull that was found was missing, first of all, and the body was laid on two lines of stones with stone slaps just laid on their pelvis. Now, Greece, of course, is the birthplace of philosophy and democracy and all that good stuff, but they also did some sacrificial shady stuff in their off time as well when they weren't slamming water down Merlot. Science allowed us to look all over the world too, not just Greece. There's ancient Egyptians, Aztecs, sometimes after Mayan ball games, the losing team would be sacrificed. Yeah, that's pretty brutal. Everyone talks about how awful humans are now. Well, we've always been the worst. The Greeks just like to party while they were doing it. At number 10, human sacrifice. If you know anything about Aztec civilization, then you're probably familiar with their sacrificial practices. Human sacrifice was a huge part of Aztec culture, and there are a number of theories to explain why these rituals were so important and happened so frequently. It is believed that the Aztecs practiced human sacrifice as a way to repay their debts to the gods, or as a display of political power. It really just depended on who was being sacrificed, which is honestly a little bit scary when you think about it. These rituals were a big deal to the community. It would involve a large gathering of people at the sacrificial temple. A priest would stand at the top of the temple with the person being sacrificed, and they would use a ceremonial knife to make an incision along the abdomen, reach inside, and pull out the person's heart while it was still beating. 
They would then place the heart in a bowl and then push the person down the temple stairs. What makes this more intense is the fact that those in attendance would also hurt themselves as part of an auto sacrificial ritual. Imagining all of this happening at once is quite mysterious and a little scary if I'm being honest. At number 9, Capture. Usually in warfare, especially in ancient times, the goal was to eliminate your enemies, so to speak. You go out there and you get rid of the threat. For ancient civilizations like the Greeks and the Romans, the amount of kills that you had determined your success as a warrior, but things were different for the Aztecs because they didn't rate your skill as a warrior on how many kills you had, but rather how many captures. It is believed that the Aztecs didn't want to kill their enemies on the battlefield and that doing so was actually very clumsy. Instead, they believed that capturing your enemy alive showed more skill on the battlefield. This is a very different practice than most other ancient civilizations because most of them were all about blood shed and gore. Now you might be wondering why they preferred to capture their enemies and not eliminate them on the battlefield and that's because they needed more people for sacrifices, point blank period. They didn't want to use their own people so they used as many outsiders as they could and battlefields were the perfect place to find new sacrifices. So capturing their opponents was just a win-win for them. Now before I carry on with the rest of these mysterious facts, let me first take a moment to ask you guys to consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far and maybe even subscribe to the channel if this type of content is really up your alley and you would like to see more of this. At number 8, Psychological Warfare Other than their practices of capturing their enemy on the battlefield, the Aztecs also had other methods of taking down their opponents and that was through psychological warfare. Within the Aztec army, there were different ranks called Jaguars and Eagles and these warriors, when in battle, wore outfits to make them look like their namesakes, either Jaguars or Eagles. The eagles wore feathers and wore wooden helmets that made it look like the warrior's face was coming out of an eagle, and the jaguars wore the skin of a jaguar and wooden helmets that looked like the animal as well. While in battle, it is believed that these outfits were used for psychological warfare to confuse their enemy and frighten them away with these agile animalistic warriors. And if their outfits and agility weren't enough to scare them off, it is said that the other Aztec warriors would also bang on drums and make a lot of noise to scare off their opponents. At number 7, Insane Weapons The Aztecs were some bloodthirsty people, as you could imagine. I mean, unaliving people was part of their everyday practice, so you could imagine that they would've come up with some pretty brutal weapons to take down their enemies, right? Well, let me tell you about one gnarly weapon that the Aztecs called Hungry Wood because of how bloodthirsty this thing was. Because the Aztecs never developed metal tools, they had to improvise to make their deadly weapons and they used what was available to them. To make the Hungry Wood weapon, they used a wooden plank and they embedded shards of obsidian into it and this thing was super sharp. Apparently it was powerful enough to take someone's head off and honestly, I wouldn't second guess that. According to a report from Spaniards who encountered the Aztecs, they once saw a warrior use this weapon to take the head off a horse in one blow. This was even tested in real life and though it took more like 3 solid blows to achieve the same outcome, the fact that this ancient tool was powerful enough to do that says a lot about this civilization. And number 6 different afterlife. In many different cultures, they have varying stories of what happens to you after you pass away. There seems to be a common theme of a quote unquote good place and a quote unquote bad place, but with the Aztecs, they were really doing something different with their stories of the afterlife, and it all depended on how you died. In Aztec beliefs, if you died as a warrior, then your soul would go on to somewhere that involved more war and you would battle there for 4 years before returning to the earth as a hummingbird. For women who died during childbirth, their afterlife involved them helping the sun prepare to rise and fall. For those who died of some kind of sickness, they went to an afterlife that had an abundance of food. And for those who simply died of old age, then they went through a trial and their souls had 4 years to pass through 8 levels of challenges, some of which included climbing an obsidian mountain and passing through an area of beasts who eat human hearts, and if they made it to the ninth level, then they would finally find peace. Their afterlife was incredibly complex and did not sound at all restful. Number 5. Shotgun Weddings Behind the closed doors of the castle walls, love lives were pretty much what you would expect them to be. Really stinky and also 
not about love. Marriage was politically motivated and there wasn't room for much love there. Women have women had essentially no say and both boys and girls could be married as soon as 12 to 14. However, compared to today, their ceremonies would be better compared to a shotgun wedding in Vegas than the ones we know. It would be completed in a matter of moments just by simply uttering consent. You could marry technically in the street or at dinner or at a pub or in bed after the deed is done. So because things got so confusing by the 12th century, marriage got more complicated. It was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. Observed being the key word. Not only did people actually have to see people saying I do, they had to see them do the deed. The bride was carried to the bed by the family and they would wait around until the act was complete. So you know what I mean. If you were lucky enough to live in a castle, you might have had bed curtains to shield the viewing, but they, they still heard everything that was going on. Number four, the mystery of Ludlow Castle. Beyond weird weddings, war, and strange food performances, castles contain secrets behind their walls we may never know, such as the mystery of the White Lady of Ludlow Castle. In the 12th century, the castle was home to Marion de la Bruyere, and she had a secret. She was in love with a secret suitor with whom she would sneak into the castle each night. She would lower a rope in true Rapunzel fashion to bring her love to her. But little did she know that her mysterious love was setting a trap for her. One night, he left the rope below so that more men could follow up behind him and take the castle. Bereft and betrayed, Marion stabbed her lover with his own sword. She then flung herself from the castle's walls and perished on the rocks below. To this day, people have stories of seeing a woman's white figure tumbling from the castle window, trapped in the desperate circumstances of her death. Number three, secret passageways. If I am ever. <laughs> Ever in my life, able to actually afford a house. We'll see. One of the ride or die requirements is a secret passageway or to a secret library. Like both. Both would be great, but a secret library is a must. And I will never tell anyone about it because how cool would it be if they found it themselves? Medieval castles were filled with secret passageways and alcoves designed to help facilitate escape should the need arise. In fact, it was kind of a requirement of fortifications to have one. The main secret entrance was called the postern. It was small, therefore easy to defend and protected by metal grates, as well as there were battlements above it. However, the entrance could be exploited if in the wrong hands. Say you have some double crossers behind your walls. They could help sneak in the enemy soldiers, such as the case of Corfe Castle during the Siege of 1645. An officer named Colonel Pittman helped aid enemy troops in through the postern, condemning the fate of the fort. Number two, where's the loo? <laughs> there are so many reasons to be thankful for modern day plumbing, but this reason above the rest. Because of plumbing, we don't need a gong farmer. What is a gong farmer? I'm not glad you asked. In castles, bathrooms were often called gongs or loos, and often overhung over the moat or onto the ground so that like whatever was happening would just drop below. There was a wooden board with a hole in it, you sat on it, did your business and got up. Simply straightforward. But sometimes the droppings fell into a cesspit like in Rochester Castle. The smell would rise up and though they didn't know about germs, they believed bad smells were unhealthy. So eventually, the pit had to be cleaned. Enter the gong farmer. This is a dirty job that even Mike Rowe would run from. They had to scoop out the stuff ferry it away and bury it. It was a dangerous job too, and one poor fellow named Richard the Raker fell into one and drowned. Now that's a way to go. And last but not least, the Tower of London Zoo? The Tower of London has seen a lot of action since it was built by William the Conqueror in the 1070s. It has housed some of history's most famous political prisoners, but did you know that at one time it was kind of a zoo? From the 1200s to 1835, the tower housed an exotic assortment of wild animals. Lions, tigers, bears, oh my, but also elephants, monkeys, and polar bears. They were brought to the castle as gifts, and if you visit the attraction now, there are wire sculptures commemorating the beasts. In 1235, Henry III was given leopards, though most likely they were lions, but they were just called that, by the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II. And that's where it all began. The king decided to start a zoo at the tower, and that he did. A polar bear joined the exhibit in 1252, and then an African elephant in 1255. A special enclosure was built, but sadly the elephant died only a couple years later, which was sadly the fate of most of the animals. Except for the lions, they did pretty well. Number 10, cold as the wind blows. Japan, we love the people, the food, the culture, and the samurai, because let's be honest, armored gentlemen of high morals with really sharp swords is just cool. Kublai Khan, being not as cool as Japan, said to himself and his massive ever-growing army, we should go get some cool from Japan. And go to get cool they did. 
While some initial boat crossings and evasions went okay, to very notable instances where it did not go very well for the Mongol invaders. The worst incident being on August 12, 1281, with a combined fleet of 4,400 ships, over 140,000 Mongol warriors were ready to invade, when seemingly a large typhoon came out of nowhere and devastated the Mongol forces, with at least half of the men drowning and only a few hundred ships remained. Casualties were very high. Those that made it to shore were hunted down by the 40,000 samurai awaiting battle. Shortly after the typhoon was dubbed the Divine Wind and was thought to be a gift from the gods. Holy for Japan, unholy for the Khan. Number 9. Ninja Vanish Samurai are distinguished by their colorful leather armor, and katanas that are forged with great care, and a code of honor that was upheld at all costs. But they were not the only warriors of ye olde times in Japan. The ninja needs no introduction, but here it goes anyway. Stealthy warriors cloaked in black who were hired for tactical espionage, and a really weird movie with turtles eating pizza with a rat. They were mercenaries hired by daimos and even samurai to get the misdeeds of war done. Sabotage and assassination were necessary in the rebellious and political climate Japan found itself in. It would see many political shifts and leaders fighting for control of a unified and fractured Japan. Number 8. My Eyes! As previously mentioned, the ninja were stealthy warriors who did the dirty jobs no one else could, specifically samurai, as the Bushido Code literally forbade them from it. And honestly, they were kind of high sniffing their own farts, as they felt a lot of things were below them, including ninjas. I for one would not want to disrespect such a worthy foe. With the ninja lack in a full military force or simply being in a traditional battle, they make up for it with their tactics and weapons. Equipped with a variety of weapons with a variety of uses, the most unholiest weapon in the ninja's arsenal was the Mitsubishi egg, not to be confused with Mitsubishi, a small container of sorts that held dirt and dust that when used would blind and disorientate the enemy. The worst flavor of this egg being filled with crushed glass. Yeah, crushed glass in the eye. It caused excruciating pain and would be quite difficult to deal with medically at the time. Honestly, who throws glass in eyes? Number 7. You can't come in. Tokugawa Lamitsu was the big bad shogun in power. And when you're the big bad shogun in power, you get to make big bad decisions. He ushered in the beginning of the Edo period, one that would see Japan prosper for a while, but it did eventually decline. Perhaps the worst part of this time was Japan's isolation. Japan basically locked itself in its bedroom and with the roar of prepubescent rage, told the world not to come into my room. Tokugawa forbade any Japanese ships from leaving and anyone from entering. The penalty for disobeying such rule was death. Japan was nervous at the time as many European nations were beginning to colonize, and if they could rip apart a dynasty like China, surely they would be next. This isolation period lasted over 200 years, and while the world moved on, Japan kind of stayed frozen in time. Of course, like most laws, they get broken, and on the southern tips of Japan's coast, there was some important trading with the Dutch, but we won't tell anybody. Number 6. Manifest Destiny Looking back on history, the United States and Japan are probably most recognized together as being combatants of that one war with that weird mustache guy, whatever it was called. And that war ending in the worst party favor ever, honestly. But that wasn't the first time these two nations met. It was a beautiful summer day in 1853 when just off the shores of Tokyo Bay, some strange ships came into view. They were American ships with cannons and they came bearing gifts to the emperor, and a very real ultimatum that can be summed up as, my friends, you have been closed for too long, open for trade, or else be annihilated, then open for trade. After some time, the Japanese really didn't have a choice. They dissolved the 200 year order to be isolated. The Americans were looking for trade, but in truth, a large motivation for their force opening of Japan was manifest destiny. God, God bless America, God bless them. Number five, William II. William II was the third son of the great William the Conqueror. As we know from the first video, he also died in an anticlimactic yet explosive way. It was only fitting that his son died in a similar fashion, however his death was a drop more menacing. There were some creepy things behind it. On August 2nd, my birthday. In 1100, King William II was on a hunting trip in New Forest. He was attended by a few people, one in particular was named Walter Tyrell. Tyrell wasn't a huge fan of the king and there were some musings as to whether he was employed by uh, William's other brother. 
We'll see. William got in his sight a stag, took aim, and fired. He didn't kill it, but injured the animal and in his excitement ran towards it. Walter Tyrell stayed back and took advantage of the situation and just went right into his heart. He strung his own bow and struck the king right in the heart. He fled immediately and was able to escape. When the rest of the party discovered him, they too fled in an attempt to protect their own interests. It was left to the countrymen to ferry the king to the cathedral for his burial because actually it turns out people weren't a huge fan of him, to be honest. Number four, King Adolf Frederick. Last time we talked about one of the King Henrys dying from a surfeit of lamprey, but he wasn't the only king to eat himself to death. Spoiler alert. King Adolf Frederick, the king of Sweden, had no way of knowing as he sat down for a meal on Shrove Tuesday the night before Lent in 1771 that it would be his last supper. He was just hoping for a good time. Lots of people loved him as king. He was a big part of the Age of Liberty during which civil rights for civil people increased. It was his parliament that saw the first legislation supporting freedom of the press and freedom of information get passed. But that night, the night before Lent, Frederick had a meal that included lobster, caviar, kippers, sauerkraut, boiled meats and turnips. Surely enough to more than satisfy the average man, but he washed it down with champagne and semlas, a decadent dessert. He ate 14 of them, on top of everything else, plus a bowl of warm milk, cinnamon, and raisins. That same day, he had such severe indigestion that the king died that day. Number three, Martin of Aragon. People didn't initially get excited when Martin of Aragon took the throne over Aragon, Valencia, Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica, but he was later referred to as Martin the Humane. So. He wasn't that bad, I guess. But no one would have guessed he would die the way that he did. Martin, like some other kings we know, also had an unhealthy appetite. Apparently, Joey from Friends could have died in that one episode of Friends where he tried to eat a whole turkey because Martin took on eating an entire goose by himself and actually did it. Something about the goose didn't agree with him and soon he retired to bed with frightful indigestion. He called for his jester to entertain him while he was ill, but the jester took a long time to get there. When he finally appeared, he told what would be the world's deadliest joke. When asked where he went, the jester replied, in the next vineyard, your majesty, where I saw a young deer hanging by his tail from a tree as if somebody had punished him for stealing figs." Unquote. Apparently this was so funny, Martin laughed for three hours until he died. So yes, he quite literally laughed himself to death. Number two, Cleopatra. I would be very surprised if anyone watching this video doesn't know who Cleopatra is, but in case you don't, here it is, here you go. Cleopatra was one of, if not the, most famous pharaoh to come out of ancient Egypt. She has inspired countless plays and movies surrounding her rule, her beauty, but most notably her love affairs with Caesar and Mark Antony. Her death is for sure up there with fictional Shakespearean characters Romeo and Juliet. Mark Antony was Caesar's general who fell deeply in love with Cleopatra. Antony had first met the young, silver-tongued, charming, and scholarly queen when she was young and involved with Caesar. After Caesar's assassination though, she was wide open, quite literally. The two had a passionate, at times messy, and later tragic love affair. Cleopatra at one time faked a suicide to try and bring back her lover from danger, but upon finding out, Antony fled to her only to make an attempt on his own life. He died in her very arms, the queen retreated with her servants to her mausoleum. There, along with her servants, she let an asp clamp on her wrist to take her life. This is the tale, but with no corpse to evaluate, and lots of legend and hearsay. Some say this, though popular, wasn't the true cause of death, but hey, tragedy sells tickets. And last but not least, King Tut. Following the path we are embarking, here we have another mysterious death in ancient Egypt, that of the one, the only, King Tutankhamun. The discovery of his mummified corpse sparked decades of rumor and curses after several people involved with the excavation died mysteriously. But the bigger mystery became how the famous ruler died at so young an age of 19. DNA tests and computerized tomography revealed he was suffering from malaria, a fractured lower leg, congenital deformities associated with inbreeding, makes sense because his father and his mother got it on and that's how he came about and so did his grandparents. Egyptians were big into incest. But that wasn't his main cause of death. Other CT scans showed he had a cleft palate, a long head, curved spine, and a fusion of the upper vertebrae. He either died of sickness or a wretched accident given his broken leg. 
One theory is that he died during a chariot race. Another theory is that he was attacked Necessity by a the of invention. No doubt archaeologists will still keep searching sure for the real we cause, thinking. but will it's we ever know? It's top 10 know? weirdest inventions of the no. 1800s. Number 10, the bullet mouse trap. You might have heard me say that and said, "What?" Which is exactly what I said when I saw a mouse trap. That's main killing potential was to fire a lead slug Minuteman style at a small rodent. It is no exaggeration to say that the difference between this mouse trap and a musket is that a musket weighs a little bit more. The mouse trap was loaded just like a traditional musket of the time, with black powder, a lead ball, and even a percussion cap. In all honesty, I'm not sure how you go about defending this mouse trap. Textbook definition of overkill. Also, you know, there's a loaded firearm in the house with a hair trigger that a small rodent could set off by gently grazing it. I like to imagine a fun family game of do I no longer have a sister or was that just a mouse after hearing a small musket fire inside the home. I also had to mention that while the immediate danger of a 32 caliber lead ball finding a new home in your stomach is frightening enough, black powder being black powder is very volatile and produces a lot of energy. Fire hazard. Smokey the fire safety dog does not approve. Number 9 T for men. Winding the clock back to the 1800s, you'll find pictures of distinguished ladies and gentlemen. And these distinguished gentlemen have the fullest and thickest mustaches ever grown by man. Much care is needed to maintain such a manly image. So when an established gentleman goes for his morning tea, it would be rather unfortunate to get his mustache wet and ruin his dashing good looks. An invention of the 1800s beckons to solve this issue with the mustache cup. Mustache cups were invented so the chivalrous men of the day didn't ruin their grooming rituals with a cup of Earl Grey tea. The cups had a small porcelain mouthpiece with a smaller hole for drinking, while the main piece would protect the stash. It may sound ridiculous, but it almost looks like a modern travel mug. So maybe they were onto something. Number 8 Nightmare Story. I don't know about you guys, but no matter how you present them, Dolls are just creepy. Have you ever noticed that when someone has a creepy doll, it's never just one? There's always a bunch of them for some reason. I, I don't know, I wouldn't want the room to feel safe or welcoming after all. <laughs> one man in 1871 said, I know, let's make them even creepier by having them move themselves. The creeping doll, as it was called, was a doll like automaton that had clock like gears to simulate real human movement, with the addition of hidden wheels underneath to aid in the doll moving across the floor. Because, you know, the last thing I need is this doll creeping into my bed at night. Whew. Number 7. Gee, this cane is heavy. As people began to settle down after imperial monarchies went the way of the dodo bird, it was a good idea in everyone's best interest to limit people carrying weapons. If people didn't have swords, it could make another revolution a little less bloody. But what's that I hear from upper class wealthy people who don't want to listen to the rules that they make? Well, how about concealed and hidden swords? Yep, that's right. Cane swords were a popular fashion accessory in the 19th century. As carrying swords fell out of fashion, royal men needed to take swords with them for self defense, or so they thought. Even women were concealing these hidden bladed inventions and parasols. However, it was socially unacceptable for a woman to have such possessions, let alone have the ability to know such training. As time went on, the hidden compartments that held blades were replaced with my personal favorite item a flask. Number six. Look at all these cool chickens. Let's face it, we all went through our awkward phases in life. And if you didn't live through the early 2000s as a youth, then bands like Linkin Park and My Chemical Romance just don't hit as hard. So when trying to find the weirdest inventions of the 1800s, I felt like closing my bedroom door and playing Green Day as I dye my hair because I'm super serious about how I feel. Why do I feel this teenage angst you ask? Well, that's because there's rose tinted glasses for chickens. Yeah, and they're cooler than me. Oh, yeah, little tiny eyeglasses for chickens, but they actually have a good use. They were designed to prevent pecking and cannibalizing other chickens. Ooh. The theory goes that if a chicken was wearing rose tinted glasses, he couldn't distinguish between blood and what wasn't. That way, they wouldn't attack each other. Yet another heartwarming comfort from the 1800s. Number five, ashes to ashes. Here's another fun punishment. Man, these guys are really creative. This one is mentioned in the Bible, so you know it's gonna be good. Basically, the Persians built a tower, and it was filled with ash. Drop criminals into the ash tower, or there were two large paddles connected to the turning wheels outside that would churn the ash and victim inside, suffocating on the hot ash. Making for a hot and dusty storm of hell and unholy foulness I can't even begin to describe. Like most things in history from this time, it has to be taken with a grain of salt. It could be very true, 
or not so true. As the Persian Empire did not leave us with much, and most knowledge of them comes from Greeks and Greek historians. But like most stories, there's truth in everything. And if that's even close to the truth, well, that's just not right, man. Number four, this is Sparta. Despite what a 2006 movie with spray on abs might mislead you, the Battle of Thermopylae was no laughing matter. It pitted the very brave Spartans against the Persian invaders. And there were a lot of them. Like, really a lot of them. Attack after attack after attack, the Persians were not getting anywhere. It wasn't until one of the Greeks betrayed the Spartans by leaving the Persians on a flank that would result in the destruction of the Spartans. Although the Persians were victorious, it was in a sense a Pyrrhic victory, as the loss of life on the Persian side far outnumbered the deaths of the Spartans. It's a battle that would be remembered for its bravery, and enough to have a movie made about it many, many years later. Number three. Here comes the boy. So after a failed attack on Greece, Persia was kinda down about that. No money in the treasury meant that the once great Persian empire was on the decline. So what better time to invade? And that's just what Alexander the Great did. Through a very lengthy campaign that lasted 10 years and a very formidable fighting force, most likely the strongest ever at the time, he shattered the declining Persian empire. He even managed to capture the city of Babylon. Talk about kicking a guy while he's down. His rule of the Persian Empire unfortunately was short lived, as he died not too long after that at the ripe old age of 32. Boy, I sure hope I lived to the ripe age of 32. Number two, the protection of Meow. Before the Persian Empire was no more, they were actually a very powerful empire. So powerful that they wanted a piece of Egypt. This war may have also been started by an insult from the pharaoh, but expanding was probably more likely. What makes this war so notable is the absolute five head play by Persia. Persia knew of the Egyptian culture and knew about their idolization of cats. So, to aid them in the invasion, the king advised them to use kitty power. Soldiers were painting cats and the god Bastet in order for Egyptians to not dare destroy an image of their god. More ridiculous than that was the use of live cats. Stray cats were rounded up and kept during battle in order to prevent the very lethal arrow fire. Soldiers still died in battle, but it is said that the cats gave enough of an advantage for there to be a Persian victory. Decent. Number one, progressive for the time. Looking back in time, we can all acknowledge that maybe we weren't so nice. And as time has moved on, we've gotten more progressive. When you think of ancient empires, you don't really think of progressive, but surprisingly, Persia was for the time. Specifically, women's rights. Women were free to move about. They were allowed to work and be higher ups and manage. But probably the most important aspect was the right to own business and property, which their European counterparts simply could not do. Look at you, Asian Persia. Way to go. Look at you. Okay, number 10. Location, location, location. So first off, let's begin at the very foundation as to why medieval castles were built in the first place. And the biggest hint lies in where they were built. From the 11th century onwards, medieval castles were built for a few reasons. One, to demonstrate wealth. Two, provide a place of defense and retreat. And thirdly, to defend important passageways and landways. Oh, and uh, it was a nice place to live. But specifically because of the last few reasons where a castle was built really, really mattered. Some were built by the sea to have a strong advantage over naval attacks, or they were built on hilltops just like you see in the movies. The more they could see, the better the chance they had of anticipating the enemy's attack. But even still, some castles took this idea to the extreme, such as Castle Monte Titano, which literally looks like it's about to fall off of a cliff any moment, or Brzezemski Castle, which was built into the side of a cliff face and is only partially visible from the outside. This would definitely make it difficult for anyone to attack the fortress given the rough terrain, but still, like, how did they even build that? How did you even build it? I don't even know. Just the talent, pure talent. Number nine, helmeted cock. No. I'm not talking about what you think I'm talking about. Think about how much entertainment you consume on a daily basis. You're watching me right now, scrolling on TikTok, Instagram, movies, Netflix, whatever you wanna do. The desire for entertainment is strong in humanity, so medieval nobles found ways to insert the funnies into everything they could, even food. Helmet and cock was one such entertaining delicacy that delighted all of the guests behind the castle walls. It was essentially a rooster stitched to a pig and then roasted. Another game they used to play with their food was live frog and chicken. They would put live frogs into pie shells so that when someone cut into it, all these frogs would just rib it about the dinner table. Hilarity! And then live chicken was significantly darker. They'd pluck a live chicken in boiling water in front of the guests, like in a jacuzzi, and when it passed out, they'd glaze it to look like it was cooked. Then they would lay it on the table, and when the chicken finally came to, it would bound up and down the table to the delight of the guests. This poor chicken who's like frantically being like, where the heck are my 
feathers, I'm naked. Just awful. Weird times, weird, weird times. What else were they gonna do? Number eight, the art of dying. To see where I'm going with this, check out this pic. Why does he look so calm? He's literally being stabbed in the head and like the side and everywhere else. While in real life, this wouldn't actually happen. You wouldn't be this calm if you were being killed. But this was the goal. People lived in a very pious society back in the medieval ages. And what with death looming around every corner with the Black Plague, you know? They developed a very unique idea about death called Ars Moriendi, the art of dying. The idea revolved around a good Christian death, that it should be planned and peaceful. I'm going to die on December 16th, blah, 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 whatever date. They didn't actually say that, but anyways. So as medieval people were lying on their deathbed in their castle, they were expected to receive it without despair or any kind of existential crisis. You had to take it honorably and if you didn't, it was looked down on. But then again, you were also dead, so what does that matter? But it was because of this belief that even in paintings depicting gore and death, the victim, who was stabbed in the head, always had like a calm expression, just like, yeah, this is fine. It's a flesh wound. Number seven. A jester versus Netflix. As soon as I said jester, you pictured a tight wearing, colorful bard with a stupid hat. Probably not far off, but the nobles had to entertain themselves somehow as previously mentioned. The castle would play host to loads of minstrels, jugglers, and acrobats. Edward II, for instance, in 1306, had hundreds at his knighting celebration. But the original meaning of the jester was just simply a good storyteller. They would wander in on dark evenings and entertain the company with fancy tales, comedic and dramatic but soon jesters became employed full time to kings and lords. Henry II had one called Roland the Musical Farter. Brain name. I wonder what he did. Every Christmas he would perform and earn a grant of the land, so they were paid pretty well. He had to be wise and quick witted in order to maintain the love of their masters. However, if they went too far. Off with her head. Tribulet, the king of France's fool, once went too far and was sentenced to execution, but he got out of it when they allowed him to choose how he would die. He simply said, old age, and he was pardoned. Again, quick witted. Number six, gazing out of windows. Imagining a world where women are restricted from education, business, autonomy, is thankfully getting harder and harder to do. But even without feminism, women still operated within the constraints of a patriarchal society in very important ways. It was their job to run the entire castle when the Lord was away, for instance. They weren't just staring out windows, waiting to lower their hair for a handsome suitor. Medieval noblewomen, for instance, had the responsibility of running the household and enforcing it. Lords were often away on crusades Crusades, war, court, or even just dead. So it was up to the ladies to run the estate, finances, and even to defend the castle against attack. Also, if the husband was dead, many women would choose not to remarry because you had more advantages being a widow than being married. You would essentially be treated as a man, especially in terms of property and things like that. Religion was also incredibly important, and one of the restrictions for women at the time was that they were forbidden from touching the altar. So in order to metaphorically dance around this, they donated their clothes to the church, which would eventually be worn by the clergymen, hence they would eventually touch the altar. A very clever way of getting around this rule, but more research needs to be done about women in the medieval ages. But this is kind of what it looked like. I have kitty love. We all know that the Egyptians loved cats. Why? I don't know. I honestly can't see why you would worship those angry little fur devils, but hey, to each their own, I guess. The Egyptians even had their own goddess for cats called Bastet, and though you might think that she was just some crazy cat lady goddess, you would be very, very wrong. Bastet had a dark side to her and was known as the Lady of Dread or the Lady of Slaughter, kind of fitting for a name for a cat goddess since they are also evil to their core. She was known to kill other gods like the god Apophis, whom she slaughtered by cutting off his head. Regardless of her dark past though, the Egyptians still worshipped her and many even worshipped her by bringing her offerings of mummified cats to her temple. Cats bring out the darkness in people, I'm telling you. At right, number 4, Boozy Blood. Sometimes we make bad decisions when we're emotional. Like those times that people punch walls when they're really mad and totally regret it afterwards. Well, even though they were deities, sometimes the Egyptian gods would do some regrettable things too. Ra the sun god had a mighty temper and was known to make some pretty rash decisions. At one point, Ra decided that he wanted everyone to just die, and so he instructed his daughter Hathor to slaughter all the humans that she could find. Hathor was totally on the same page and was like, okay, bet, and went off to kill some humans. 
Luckily for humanity though, Rock came to his senses and had a change of heart, but by the time he caught up to Hawthor, she became so bloodthirsty that there was no stopping her. So in an attempt to trick her into stopping her killing conquest, Rock filled 7,000 jars with beer and gave it to Hawthor, who then became so drunk that she just gave up on her mission and decided not to kill everyone. Now they say that alcohol can't solve all your problems, but in this case it certainly did. At number 3 creation. There are so many creation stories out there created by various religions and civilizations. One of the more bizarre creation stories however belongs to the ancient Egyptians because their first god did something a little weird to create life as we know it. These ancient people believed that their very first god Atum created himself and as such he had no wife and literally no one else to potentially procreate with and so to create his children and thus create humanity, he pumped the hose and released humanity if you get what I'm saying here. If not, you're too young to be here. Anyways, out of his pleasurable process, he created his kids Shu and Tefnut. This legend also created the term the god's hand and was used to refer to women back in ancient Egypt, since Atum's hand played the quote unquote female role in the creation of his offspring. But yeah, I guess you could say that Atum was very pleased with what he created. And number two, giant snake. There were a lot of strange animals in Egyptian mythology, one of them being a giant snake. The Egyptian god Apep was a giant snake who had some serious snake beef with their sun god Ra. They were polar opposites, Ra being the light, literally, and Apep representing darkness, chaos, and evil. One day, Apep just seemed to have had enough with Ra and all of his sunshine goodness and positive vibes and just swallowed him up. He gobbled up Ra and the sun, leaving the world in complete darkness. Luckily, the other gods were there to save the day and they had to slice Apep's belly open to free Ra and restore light to the world. This evil danger noodle lost this battle, but at least he got a taste of that spicy meatball in the sky. And finally, at number one, a hearty meal. There are two sides to every person. Some people are nice on the surface, but they have a dark core that they keep hidden from the world. And the same could sort of be said for the Egyptian god Khonsu. You see, the gods were seen as helpful, but people also feared them, for good reason. I mean, these guys could pack a punch, and Khonsu was one of those guys with a serious dark side. Khonsu was the god of the moon, and was also seen as the god of healing. Sounds super positive and all, however, he was also known to eat people's hearts. Yeah, human hearts were a choice snack of his, but he was also known to dine on the hearts of select gods as well. He definitely isn't the guy to mess with because you might become his next hearty meal. Before we wrap things up for today, I want you guys to leave a comment down below telling me what you thought the most insane story from this video was. The Egyptian gods did some weird stuff, so tell me what shocked you the most down in the comments. Number 10, Rasputin. Okay, technically not a kingly leader, but he was a religious leader and the way he died is crazy. If it weren't for the technicality alone, he would probably be number one. Bold statement, I know. It took everything for this dude to die. He was the Russian Tsarina's favorite, but people thought he was the Antichrist. Just to prove such a claim, on June 29, 1914, a courtesan named Guseva gutted him in the belly until she was satisfied. Once she'd done the deed, she stepped back and proclaimed, I have killed the Antichrist. So there you go, people believed it. But they made another attempt on his life. On December 16th, 1916, Rasputin's enemies tried to kill him once again. This time, they laced the cake with enough cyanide to kill five grown men. But Rasputin was fine. No reaction whatsoever. What the heck? Frustrated, a man named Yusupov shot him several times and then left him for dead. He returned later to fetch the body, but instead he found a bloody and angry zombie Rasputin. As Rasputin was chasing him, another noble shot him and this time he died? I don't know. To make sure they threw him into the river. After his body was recovered, an autopsy revealed he had water in his lungs, meaning the man was still alive before he drowned. After burying him for a time, they dug him up to burn his body, and while he burned, he appeared to sit up in the flames, though this is most likely due to the fact that they didn't cut his tendons, so it was just a result of like him shriveling up. But still, took a lot of tries, my man. Took a lot of tries. Number 9, King Charles VIII. If you haven't learned
couldn't yet take care of head injuries, then you need to take first aid because that's like the number one rule. There ain't no room to mess around, anything could happen. Take Charles VIII for example. He was the king of France in the late 15th century and became king at just the age of 13. Unlike his conniving father, he was described as pleasant and likeable. Charles the Affable, so he was called. But in his 28th year, the king would face his demise in a way no one suspected. In a tennis court, of all places. He was really keen to catch a match and as he was rushing to watch it, he knocked his head on a door frame really hard. He got up and said he was fine and enjoyed some of the game, but halfway through, he collapsed. Physicians requested he not be moved for fear of increasing his injury, so they made a makeshift bed in the stands where he spent his last hours of life. He died on a tennis court of all places. Number 8. King Barbarossa. Fate was laughing, man. Fate was freaking laughing. Had Holy Roman Emperor Frederick Barbarossa managed to join Richard the Lionheart for his crusade, it would have most definitely turned out differently. Barbarossa was legendary for his skill in battle and military expertise. He was one of the most highly feared leaders in the crusades with a ferocious army behind him. But on June 10th, 1190, fate would intervene. He was leading his troops into Turkey on their way and came across a river they had to cross. His men recommended that they find a bridge to cross instead, but Barbarossa was confident that they could cross it on horseback. He rode his horse into the waves, but his horse wasn't strong enough to withstand the current and Frederick's metallic form because he was wearing a lot of armor. It was his armor that ended up dragging the two beneath the depths. After his death, his army completely fell apart because they panicked and they never made it to the Holy Land, but this guy literally got dragged underwater by the weight of his armor. That's how he died. Number seven, Humayun. Humayun was one of the Mughal kings of the Mughal Empire who faced a lot of political strife during his reign, from his brothers and outside enemies. But in 1555, he finally won back Delhi and recovered a throne once lost to him. The whole kingdom cheered him on, with crowds lining the streets to welcome him home. After everything he went through, he was right to party. Despite his brothers being a huge reason as to why he was kicked off the throne in the first place, his father on his deathbed was like, dude, you can't kill your brothers, so he had to forgive them but blinded them so they could never become king. But his victory wouldn't last long. He died in the most unpredictable way. He was walking up to the tower towards his library, arms full of books, when he tripped and fell. He fell so hard and fast that he fractured his skull, and thus was the end of his legacy. Number 6, Sato. This is probably one of the darkest ones that I have ever read. It's horrendous, uh, but it's also like, uh, does the crime match the punishment? We don't know. The Crown Prince Sato of Korea was known to be quite the terror. He had a terrible relationship with his father growing up, who was also abusive and bullied and tore him down since birth, which definitely led to his cruel behavior later in life. However, the things he did, still inexcusable. Sato was prone to violent outbursts and his subjects knew him to be a cruel violator, bully, and even took the lives of some of his servants with his own bare hands. His father got to the point where he had to figure out a way to remove him as his successor. The boy turned into such a horrendous figure, his parents weren't so great either, mind you, that his mother, his own mother, condemned him to death. Now they could have hung him, they could have done anything other than this, but this is what they did. There are a lot more humane ways to take someone's life, but did they do any of them? No. Instead they locked their own son into a rice chest for 8 days until he suffocated to death. Once he was gone, the chest was open. Rough way to go. At number 5, Sneaky Link. In ancient Egyptian literature, women were often portrayed as seductresses. One of the more famous stories telling the tale of a seductress is one called the Tale of the Two Brothers. Essentially, the story goes that a man, his wife, and his younger brother all lived together. One day, the two men went out to do some farm work, and while they were out, the one man told his brother to go back to the house to get some grain sacks. When he reached the house, the wife noticed the brother and complimented him on his strength and tried to seduce him. The brother got angry and refused, but told the wife that he wouldn't say anything to her husband about their encounter. 
Still, she was worried that the brother would snitch, and so she made herself look like she had been beaten up, and when her husband returned, she pretended like the brother was the one who tried to seduce her. The husband got angry and threatened to kill his brother, but in an attempt to save his own skin, the brother told the husband the truth and even cut his bits off and threw his pee pee into the river just to prove his point, where it was promptly eaten by fish. Unfortunate. The husband then returned home to his wife, where he killed her and fed her to dogs. Not a happy ending for anyone, but it gives you a real sense of how adultery worked back in those days. At number 4, no Viagra. Just like anyone else these days, back in ancient Egypt, sometimes people had performance issues. Impotence was apparently a really big issue for many Egyptian men. It was such a common issue that sometimes it infiltrated their art and there were some scrolls and statues about it. An ancient Egyptian proverb was created about such a topic that said, quote, He who is shy to have intercourse with his wife will not get any children. Now obviously there are things nowadays that can help with such an issue, but back then people resulted to prayer and magic to help their little buddies out. Don't really know how well that worked out for them, but it's a struggle that a lot of people face, so at least they weren't alone. At number 3, LGBTQ+. As with anywhere on earth, there were same sex relationships, and the same goes for ancient Egypt, however documentation of such things were far and few. The only 100% clear cut case of same sex relationships that was documented in ancient Egypt comes from the story of Horus and Seth. The story goes that Horus and Seth were both vying for the throne, and one night Horus pretended to be drunk while Seth tried to take advantage of him while Horus slept. Not the greatest example, but it's what we've got that's actually confirmed. Another potential recorded gay relationship may have come from Egypt's King Pepu II, who was thought to have had a secret relationship with one of his generals at nighttime. One of the most well known potential gay relationships from those times, though, comes from a piece of Egyptian art that showed two men touching noses. Doesn't seem like anything too intimate, but back then, touching noses was another way of kissing. The two men depicted, though, were thought to be brothers, so it's theorized that there was something a little spicy going on there, but we don't have to think about that one too hard. At number two, dirty insults. What is your favorite insult? Don't be shy, you can tell me, this is a safe space. I guess I have a number of favorites, but one that I quite enjoy is saying that someone's mother is a horker, like in Skyrim. Back in the times of ancient Egypt, however, insults often included some kind of note. If they needed to hurl an insult at someone, they might say something like, quote, may you copulate with a donkey, or may a donkey copulate with your wife. People would also combine some kind of note with pointing out someone's flaws to create an insult. In a note found from one of the people who built one of the great pyramids, they insulted one of their co-builders by saying, quote, you are not a man because you cannot get your wives pregnant like your fellow men. Like damn, that's pretty cold dude. And finally at number one, the magic pee pee. <laughs> Now, I had to save this next fact for our number one spot because it's probably one of the most bizarre things that I've ever learned about ancient Egypt. The Egyptian god Min was the male fertility god, and let's just say that he was quite unique. He was known for his bold feathered headdress and the fact that his loincloth snake was always being charmed, if you get what I'm saying. Men suffering from impotence would make offerings to him to help them with their fertility problems. Even to this day, figures of the god Min are used in magic rites. Men and women still visit the ancient temples to find figures of the god and literally rub his to overcome their problems. Sounds strange, but apparently so many people have done it that the stone that it's carved into has become worn down or darkened from how many hands have touched it. Now I can only imagine what this god's body count was. Kicking off the list at number 10, the bird. The bird is not the word. It's actually pretty offensive. To flip somebody the bird or to flip somebody off, of course, means to give them the middle finger. What are these little troublesome guys right here, one of these blurry dudes right here. Do we even know why we do this? I mean, I don't recommend it because obviously you'll get in a heap of trouble from whoever's on the other end, the receiving end of said finger. But giving somebody the middle finger comes from the fourth century BC in Athens. The philosopher Dino Genes expressed how he felt to visitors about Demosthenes. He described him by making a, well, you guessed it, a middle finger. It's a phallic gesture. The middle finger is supposed to be your, you know, the your bird, for lack of a better term. And the surrounding curled fingers are meant to be the, you know, the other things that are around said thing on the body. I'm trying not to say what I really want to say here, but the bird is meant to, you know, it's supposed to be one of those. The more you know, ancient Greek history, who would have thunk? Number nine. Column Wars. While the Greeks were going head to head with the Turks, they were fighting over their independence, of course, and the Greeks had the upper hand at Acropolis one day. They were surrounding their enemy and they had this stronghold in their grasp, and the Turks at the same time were running out of ammo. 
and options. They then began to break apart the marble columns around them, just smashing them to pieces, just breaking them as fast as they can to try and get lead from inside and use that as ammo. Now, as the Greeks witnessed the destruction of their Parthenon, they panicked, obviously. They said, here, just take ammo instead. Whatever you do, just don't break those columns. We can keep fighting. In fact, we'll supply you the ammunition. Just don't break those columns. And they did. 1821, Greek War of Independence. Here you go, Ottoman Empire. Take this lead. Now we can fight. Let's do it. It's like when you're at a house party, they're like, just fight each other. Just don't put a hole in the wall. I'll be grounded. Seriously. I can't fix that. I don't know how to. Number eight, zombies. It doesn't matter what the context is. Zombies are always scary. Whenever we talk about ancient Egyptians, we break down the process of mummification. And you know what? I'll be honest, I missed that part. Just keep everything in jars. Keep everything separate in different rooms. Keep everything safe, surrounded by treasure in the middle of a tomb. No zombie is coming back to life if that's the case. You know what I mean? Well, ancient Greeks actually believed in zombies as well. They had steps they would take to prevent the dead from ever walking again. Archaeologists found graves where bodies were weighed down with rocks, or they would be pinned to their tombs. One of the two. Both pretty horrible. They weren't called zombies, of course, but rather revenants, reanimated corpses that return to terrorize the living, aka zombies. It's, it's a zombie. Dr. Solowski Weaver explains that bodies found at a cemetery near the ancient town of Camarina in southeast Sicily were feared to come back to life at one point. The town was once a Greek colony, of course now modern day Italy, but it's home to a third century cemetery with around 3,000 bodies in there. There's more than half of them that are buried with coins, the usual, but a few of them were found in specific ways, peculiar ways. One body found in tomb 653, their body was covered in large fragments of amphora. So it's whatever it was underneath there, they didn't want that to move. Which is weird, because you're like, okay, I know that they're dead. Why are we putting a rock on them? You know, that, that fear, we still have it today. Number seven, stone cold. When the pandemic first began, one of the hardest things to get a hold of, surprisingly, was toilet paper. Yeah, it's pretty important. It's more important than we realized because that was the thing on the news that we saw. People just boxing each other at a Walmart for toilet paper. When you run out of toilet paper, you often remember that moment regardless of where you are forever. Leaves of three, let them be. That's all I'm saying. But ancient Greeks used these small ceramic pieces to wipe. Yeah, ceramic pieces, like sharp. French anthropologist Philippe Charlier expands on this toilet hygiene history in the British Medical Journal. It was these flat terracotta discs found in these ancient sites and they had residue on them, so the proof's in the pudding. They also discovered a Greek cup which said three stones are enough to wipe one's arse. Three stones. See, even today it's like three pieces, you know, three slices, three stones. It's always three. Yeah, Greeks would use pebbles to wipe their butts. Never take the go for granted ever again. Number six, naked exercise. Okay, this one, honestly, I'm just saying it's unusual, but I'm on board with it. You ever forget a towel when you're showering? You gotta do that weird naked silly run through the hallway? I'll be honest with you guys, that's my favorite run. I feel like one of those aliens from Signs, just walking around all light, naked, and lanky. Just meant for speed, you know, meant for greatness. Just wet, just like a lizard, just slipping around all over the kitchen. Ancient Greeks used to work out naked. The word gymnasium translates to the Greek term gymnasion, which meant school for naked exercise. Yeah, growing up, I always wanted to go to Xavier's school for gifted youngsters. Now, I just want to go to Ezekiel's school for naked exercise. Just don't set up shop behind the guy working on his squats. That's probably a bad idea. You know what? The more I think of this, the more I convince myself it's a pretty terrible idea. Hey man, do you mind spotting me? Sure. Number five. I'm coming out of this hole, partner. We enjoy many luxuries in the 21st century. Warm houses, everyday appliances, and the freedom to shout profanities at strangers on the internet you slightly disagree with, but you give them the business anyway because it's been a bad week and you deserve it. But probably what we should all be thankful for is modern medicine. Back in the 1800s, it just wasn't where it is today. A great example of that is safety coffins, a truly grim situation. A medical doctor has declared you dead, and now you are being buried alive. Have no fear, friends, because you had enough money for a safety coffin. The coffin contained a device or means of various designs, which was to alert the living of your mistaken burial and hopeful resurrection. The very rational fear of being buried alive most likely was spun from fiction and news at the time, with the occasional case happening here and there. However, I'm of the opinion it should be a never ever kind of thing. Yeah, no thanks. Number four, your bad hair day has just been terminated. Oh, to live in a time of industrial revolution where machines go and go. I'm sure that all this heavy industry won't enable bad practices of corporations and usher in the destruction of our environment. Pfft. No, sir! This is the age of machines, and if machines can help with one thing, it most certainly can aid in another. 
May I introduce you the Rotary Hairbrush? Why brush your own hair when an overcomplicated machine can do it for you? At the time, it kind of made sense. Machines felt like they were the way of the future. They were kind of right, but at this rate, everything in the home would have intricate pulleys or a steam engine attached. Steampunk, anyone? Number three, full of air. The Industrial Revolution changed the world. We can't deny that. That can also be said for the steam trains. But what about pneumatic power trains? Back in the 1800s, a man named Alfred Eli Beach came up with such a design. Prior testing had proven useful enough to build a larger demonstration in New York. So he built a tunnel to test his air power train. It only ran a short distance, but the train held 22 people and was controlled by a roots blower nicknamed the Western Tornado. That was also my nickname in high school. Sadly, the project didn't receive much support from the government at the time and other methods for trains eventually took over. Unfortunate because it sounds like Alfred Eli Beach was very dedicated to the project, as he put up a very large sum of money to the project. The tunnel that housed the short train the tunnel that housed the short train line was completed in 58 days. While he did have bigger plans for his train, it kind of just became an amusement for people. It was shortly shut down thereafter. But 58 days, that's pretty quick. I'd like to see that happen in a major city now. No way it's happening. Number two, get on my mongoose, bro. Looking at the Motor Scout, you can see the beginnings of what could be a four wheeler. Personally, I think it looks like a mongoose from Halo, but mom thinks I play too many games. Designed by F.R. Sims in the late 1890s, it was never really meant for off-road terrain, instead to support infantry on smooth roads. Sims understanding the annoyance of trying to ride your motorized quad cycle while someone is firing at you, placed a Maxim machine gun on the quad to return fire. Which is strange, because usually these things require a team of soldiers to operate. He also added an iron shield for a little extra protection. It is too bad the next major conflict would have a lack of usable roads and more trenches than anything else. While it never did see combat, it was somewhat useful and would later inspire Sims to design the first armored car. Number one, bro, trust me. Everyone has a favorite article of clothing. For sports fans out there, it could be a lucky jersey, but back in the 1800s, there was an article of clothing no British soldier could be without, the cholera belt. What does the cholera belt do exactly? Well, it helps to prevent cholera. I've got good sources bro, trust me. The running not so scientific theory at the time was that any abdominal issues and sickness was caused by a chilly belly. So simply make your tummy warm and voila, cholera has been prevented. British soldiers in India were often given the belts unaware of the biohazard that was an epidemic. The belts were just flannel that basically wrapped around you. It's a good thing we're not superstitious today and would never buy into such ridiculousness. Hey man, did uh, my order of healing crystals come in? I'm getting some bad voodoo vibes at home lately, man. I totally need to cleanse that space, bro. At number 10, brotherly love. There were some weird things happening between the gods in Egyptian mythology, as we will come to learn through this video. To get us started on this journey through the strangest of stories, let's talk about some serious closeness between the gods Osiris and Isis. These two gods were husband and wife, but they were also brother and sister. Yeah, it's weird, but they were gods, so I guess it was fine. These two ruled Egypt until their other brother, Set, killed Osiris. When her husband died, Isis went on a search to find Osiris' body because she just really wanted to have a child with him and just wasn't gonna let pesky old death get in her way. When she found Osiris' remains, she was able to resurrect him for long enough for them to conceive a child. However, that process was a little difficult because she wasn't able to get the most important part of him for that because a fish had apparently eaten his member. Again, Isis was a very resilient woman, and quite crafty too because she just crafted him a new device, if you will, and they went on to produce a son, Horus, who would later become the new king of Egypt. This story is a little weird, don't get me wrong, but it's also a story of perseverance, I guess, so maybe it's not all bad. Hi number nine, trophies. I know a lot of people like to save little mementos and souvenirs from things that meant a lot to them in life. People save movie stubs from their first date with someone, little objects from their childhoods, and a whole collection of other things saved from different points of their lives. There was an Egyptian god who sort of did the same thing, but a little creepier. Well, actually it was a lot creepier. The god Anubis was the god of mummification, and I guess you could say that he just 
really liked his job. He was part of the embalming process for some big names like Osiris. See, tying it back to the previous story when the god Set killed his brother Osiris, he got pretty buddy buddy with Anubis because he offered Osiris' organs to the god of mummification. But not for Anubis since he was known to collect pieces of the remains of people that he had embalmed. He had a thing for limbs and other remains, I guess. It was a weird collection to have, that's for sure, but for the god of mummification, it almost seems fitting. Before we carry on talking about some of these strange things that Egyptian gods did in their mythology, why not leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, maybe consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, The Last Snack For the Egyptians, a person's burial and their soul's final journey was a very big deal. We are probably all familiar with the mummification practices of the ancient Egyptians and all that, but what comes after was also pretty interesting. When someone died, it was believed that their soul would then move on to be judged. The soul would leave their body and go to the underworld, searching for the Hall of Truth. Once they found it, they would then be judged on who they were in their life, and if they passed the test, then they got to go to paradise. But if they failed, then they became a nice little snack for the goddess Emmet. Emmet was known as a demon goddess and dubbed the Devourer of Amenti. When the deceased was tested and their heart was weighed against a feather, if they failed that test, then Emmet would eat the person's essence and they would vanish for eternity. Obviously, you wouldn't want that to happen, so I guess this was just an incentive for Egyptians to live life as a good person. At number 7, Down the Nile now I know that I've mentioned the story of Set and Osiris a couple times now, but their story is just so messed up and weird that I have to keep including the best parts of it. Anyways, we all know that Set overthrew his brother Osiris as a king of Egypt, and did so by killing him, but let's talk about exactly how that happened. Set was a really jealous guy, and he resented his brother for being king, so he devised a plan to trick his brother into a coffin. Set had a coffin designed exactly for Osiris' measurements, and while at a party, Set challenged Osiris to get in it, as he promised that he would give the coffin as a gift to anyone who could fit inside it. So yeah, it was rigged from the start. So Osiris gets inside, and obviously it was a perfect fit. What he didn't know though was that this was where he would remain forever because Set sealed his brother in the coffin and sent it down the Nile River. After that, Osiris' wife slash sister Isis went to go find him and blah blah blah, we already know what happens next. At number 6, Lady of Plagues. Guys, if you haven't already clued in, we're still in a panorama, a panzerati. A pandemic. It seems like it'll never end, and after learning about the Egyptian goddess Sekhmet, I think I know why we're all going through this. It's because someone pissed her off big time. Sekhmet was known as the Lady of Terror, and if you don't get a good sense as to who she was just by her name, just you wait. This goddess had the ability to spread pestilence and plague against anyone who remotely angered her. So judging by that, I think if you believe in this kind of thing, someone has some serious apologizing to do. Because of this insane power, Egyptians were brought up to know that they had to stay on Sekhmet's good side, otherwise it would be risking the health and safety of themselves and those around them. So this is a PSA to whoever made Sekhmet so mad, please go apologize. Buy her some flowers, make a sacrifice or two if you have to. Please just make her stop. It's literally my birthday today and all I want to do is live out my 20s in peace. Please, just do it for me. At number five. Number five, Shroud of Turin. They say art is subjective, but what does the Shroud of Turin really show us here? Is it JC? Is it Jesus Christ himself? Many believe the cloth shows an image of Jesus when he was crucified, and once you see it, it's hard to argue otherwise, hard to get out of your mind. Radiocarbon tests do date the cloth back to around 1260, and recent studies suggest that Shroud was used in medieval church plays that would depict this exact scene, the resurrection of one Jesus Christ. What do you think? Accurate representation or another Another case of face pareidolia. Face pareidolia is when you see Jesus and things. I look at our producer Chris. I see Jesus every day, right there. A little bit more Jack than Jesus, but you know, same image, more or less. Number four, summer is canceled. Back in 2013, scientists discovered a volcano on Lombok Island in Indonesia that went off sometime around May to October 1257. And scientists all agree that this eruption was the largest blast that the Earth had seen in 7,000 years. So it was quite a spectacle, a horrible spectacle. 
if that. Cut to the next year, 1258, the following cold temperatures ruined crops and brought famine to pretty much all of Europe. Cattle were all dying off quickly, it was far too cold for them to even stand a chance, and it's estimated that London saw 15,000 deaths that year alone. Experts believe that this volcanic eruption was a factor in the Little Ice Age that changed global temperatures from the 14th to 19th century. That's like if Yellowstone went off tomorrow. It would be a really bad time, and then well, afterwards would be almost worse, if anything. No resorts for a while, I think. Definitely not. Number three, the Great Famine. The medieval adjective game, back again with the Great Famine. Awesome, another great. All of Northern Europe suffered the Great Famine in 1315, so only like 60 years after that volcano went off. I mean, like, what luck is that? What a terrible time to be alive. 1315 to 1317, two years of famine, countless lives were lost, and of course, with people losing hope, crime rate shot up to an extreme level. Can't even describe some of the things that were recorded, but my God, people were horribly insane. The Great Famine brought unrest in peasants, but it also disturbed members of nobility. It's always nice when that happens, right? It's not all of us suffering. Some of these noble purple lords up here are also starving. Cool, we're even. They were set back and in turn, they gave up the oath of chivalry. Yeah, talk about the dark ages. They're like, eh, you know what? No. Number two, plague bear. Bus boys, but for bodies. Let's do it. My God, this one's really dark. The hot summer of July 1665, right before London saw that great fire. What to do with all of these poor souls who have been hit by the plague? Now bodies at this point were literally starting to pile up. So we need a new profession, somebody that deals specifically with these horribly infected bodies. Any volunteers, show of hands? Yep, we got one. Like a plague bear, for example. There we go, just what we need. A plague bear has your back and your front and all of your infected places. Church wardens would organize burials. This was a normal thing back in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up. If somebody had the plague, well, these plague bears, they, these brave souls, they would step up. They were the ones responsible for transporting all these bodies far, far, away, and then they would bury them, right? Just way over there. Great idea, honestly, the further the better. Couldn't agree more. A church would house these plagued souls away from society. Now, it sounds sad, but this was the best call, all things considered. So no, you weren't visiting any of your deceased loved ones anytime soon. And finally, number one, medieval punishment cleaner. This one really sucks. Best for last, here we go. Back in medieval times, many executions were public. The town would come out, watch a hanging or two, and then grab some bread and then head home. They're like, hey, classic Sunday. This was normal back in medieval days. Medieval punishments were like an event, but like modern events, somebody has to stick around and clean the place up. One of the earliest documented executioners goes back to 1202. He was the OG headsman. His name was Nicholas Johann, and their nickname was The Justice. The Justice. Are you kidding me? My palms are already sweating. Are you sure it wasn't the mountain? My God. Afterwards, this position spread through many capitals and large towns of Western Europe, and with them came the execution cleaners. Yeah, just a squeegee and a spray ball. They're like, hey, which table boss? Let's do this. Over his 36 years of ruling, King Henry VIII executed roughly 57,000 people. Yeah, welcome to the Middle Ages. Hope you like mopping. You're gonna be doing it a lot. Like a lot, a lot. Yeah.